Welcome, everybody. It's nice to be back home, and thank you all for being here. Um, sorry, we're a few minutes late. We had a kind of a packed uh, closed session agenda. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the Pledge of Allegiance, and Trustee Orozco has um, uh, said that she will lead us. Thank you so much. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Do I need to come forward? Okay. Thank you. So again, um, welcome, and um, we're happy to be back here. We're very grateful that um, the Watsonville City Council um, lent us their um, chambers over the last year, so we were able to welcome more people to come and um, participate in our board meetings, um, but we sure are happy to be back, so we're glad you're here. Um, I will go ahead and um, move now to superintendent comments, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome. So our, um, will you be putting up the pictures, Jeff? Yes. You'll put up, okay, great. So our extended learning team, led by Director Carol Ortiz, has been ensuring that thousands of students um, continue to learn over the summer. So nuestro equipo de aprendizaje extendido, dirigido por la directora Carol Ortiz, se ha asegurado de que miles de estudiantes están aprendiendo durante el verano. And I had the opportunity to visit um, one of our seven elementary sites, H.A. Hyde, and see some of those 2,200 elementary students in action engaging in STEAM activities. And they engaged in Eventually, you'll see it up there. Um, they engaged in science exploration through the physics bus, technology and engineering through LEGO Robotics, arts through our Spectrum partners, and mathematics through our certificated staff. And it is wonderful to see the students so motivated and engaged in their learning. So tuve la gran oportunidad de visitar uno de nuestros siete sitios de primaria H. E. Hyde y a ver algunos de los 2,200 estudiantes de primaria en acción participando en actividades de STEAM. Se dedicaron a la exploración científica a través del autobús de física, la tecnología en la ingeniería de a través de las robóticas de Lego, las artes a través de nuestros socios de Spectrum y las matemáticas a través de nuestro personal certificado. Fue maravilloso ver a los estudiantes tan motivados y comprometidos en su aprendizaje. I was also able to visit our students participating in both Summer in the City and the partnership with Digital Nest. Our high school students have really grown through these experiences. We're already looking at ways to expand these programs next year. These two programs complement the other 560 students participating at Aptos High School. So también um, pude visitar a nuestros estudiantes que participaron tanto en Summer in the City como la asociación con Digital Nest. Y nuestros estudiantes de secundaria realmente han crecido a través de esa experiencia. Ya estamos buscando formas de, expand de expandir esos um, programas el próximo año. Estos dos programas um, siguen con los otros um, seis o cinco, cinco 500, perdón, 550 um, estudiantes que participaron en la secundaria de Aptos. So thank you very much. Thank you. And before we move on, I just also wanted to mention that we do have a translator. If anybody is um, needing translation, uh, you can see our translator and get some equipment for that. So thank you. Um, now, governing board comments, I guess I'll start with Maria. Do you have anything? None. Okay. Kim? Um, we had a great time on the 4th of July. Uh, Leslie and I marched both in the um, parade in Aptos and the parade in Watsonville. We were very um, happy to see the beautiful families that were out to celebrate um, our Independence Day. Um, later that night, we attended um, Fire in the Sky at Watsonville. It was another great um, event with a wonderful fireworks show, family friendly. So it was just a beautiful time. 
Thank you. So just very briefly, um, a couple of weeks ago we had a board study session on the budget um, and I just wanted to extend another thanks to our CBO Joe over here and his staff. Uh, they really prepared um, an amazing presentation that was so well put together and easy to understand for those of us that aren't experts in school finance. It can be um, not e a an easy read and they really did a good job and showed a lot of transparency and um, I'm real I'm confident that we're going to continue on that path and there's so much work that was put into it. Um, uh, just really pleased and, and we didn't have an audience which I was um, a little disappointed but I understand so um, but I wanted you to know the entire board was very thankful for that and we did um, express our gratitude so um, you're welcome thank you and um, August 13th is our welcome back breakfast at Watsonville High School and I, I'm sorry I forgot is it 8 o'clock 730 7.30 a.m. at Watsonville High in the cafeteria. So um, anyone who can come, you're welcome. And we're really looking forward to welcoming new hires as well as our returning staff. So thank you. Okay, um, item 4.1 is approval of the agenda. Would somebody like to make a motion? Make, make a approval? motion, oh, sorry, to approve the agenda tonight. I'll second. Second, okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion passes 403. And I, I should also mention, since we only have four board members here tonight, we have to have four zero votes for things to pass. Um, so that's something that we don't see often because we do usually have um, mostly full participation at board meetings. But just to let you know, that's how we're going to um, have to move through this board meeting. Um, item 5, uh, 5.1 is approval of minutes for the June 27th, 2018 meeting. And um, I think we were all here, but I don't really recall. So you will have to let me know with an abstention if necessary. A second. Okay, we have an approval and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, but with four or zero with three absences. And um, for our special board meeting July 11th that I just mentioned, um, these minutes are here up for approval as well. Move approval. Second. Mm. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And no opposed? Motion passes 403. Thank you. Uh, visitor non agenda items, do we have speakers tonight? We do not have any. We don't have speakers, okay. Um, so item 7 is our employee organization comments and 7.1 is PVFT. Hi Francisco, welcome. Hey, thank you. Happy new fiscal year. Um, I hear you all had a really good news from the state budget. Um, and it's apparent from um, the agenda today. Uh, sounds like there's a lot of money, plenty of money. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to uh, comment on a, um, make a few comments on some other items on the agenda, including uh, the presentation on risk management. Um, uh, you should be aware that uh, we do have in contract um, PVFT uh, as a participant of the safety committee. Uh, the safety committee met a total of once last year. Um, from a practice of meeting monthly in previous years. Um, I spoke before um, at one of these meetings to you regarding our concern that the safety committee was going the way of the benefits committee uh, in prior years. Uh, thankfully, the benefit committee seems to be coming back on track um, and uh, it's, it's obvious from our tenor of agreement that uh, it really helped to get that committee back on track. Um, and so we're hoping that uh, this is the situation with the safety committee. Uh, there has been some changes to the safety committee that were uh, done unilaterally uh, in previous years. And uh, we are concerned about that. Um, 
the specific changes are the requirement, for example, of uh, a rotational um, membership uh, on the committee. Uh, our contract, our agreement with you is that PVFT appoints two people. Uh, and there's no limits, there's no terms, there's no uh, determining who gets to be appointed. Uh, so we don't see that unilateral change as uh, something that we welcome. Uh, we do welcome, however, uh, any proposals uh, coming from the, the board or the district uh, to make sure that uh, we make this committee uh, a functional committee uh, that will uh, serve uh, your employees uh, well. Um, and evidence of that hopefully will be uh, less injuries, uh, less costs uh, for um, workers' compensation and uh, other um, unnecessary uh, expenses that um, can be avoided through uh, good uh, risk management and awareness of employees. Um, so uh, with that, I uh, look forward to the uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, President DeRose, I, I say that all the time, yes, DeRose, not Serpa, sorry, coming back. Um, Superintendent, Leticia Lopez, CSEA, President, and um, I'm so happy to see everybody and so happy to see you close up because pretty far the other way. We are here tonight to let you know that we're very excited about the new school year starting and um, excited to have everyone back to work and ready to go into their classrooms and other duties as, as assigned. Um, we are also um, wa have gone through the packet and have been told previously about positions that are being presented to you tonight. The transportation supervisor we're very excited about because the need is there, we realize that, uh, as well as um, the new position in human resources that we see the need for an individual to come in and work um, in that arena, in that field. Um, so the only thing that we ask the district is that it be open for recruitment, um, open for recruitment, because we, we understand that um, it may not have been, but that is what we are asking for, just in case it wasn't going to be. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it. So, thank you. Ms. Murillo, as first VP, I just wanted to share um, concerns of our membership as well, as far as uh, we understand and um, and aware of the need of the positions coming up, coming forth. But we're also concerned uh, with the fact that um, we may become too top heavy. And in the past, uh, when budget crisis arise, um, we also have experienced that uh, we lose classified. So please keep that in mind as well. Thank you. Do we have anyone from Pavam? No. Um, CWA? No? Okay. So we'll move on to report and discussion items. Um, item 8.1 is our risk and safety review. Um, yes. President um, DeRose, board members, um, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm still looking that way for you. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Sheila um, Safety Shanahan uh, to present to you the risk and safety review. So before I begin my, my presentation, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, to Dr. Rodriguez for your foresight in realizing that this was a very much needed position in this district and also to the board members for your support of her vision and um, going ahead and reinstating this position. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't be able to talk to you tonight. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, I also would like to, t uh, to thank Dr. Colleen and Mr. Rodri or Mr. Dominguez um, for their continued and ongoing support, as well as Mix Mr. Victor Sandoval and his team. Um, they are critical to the safety efforts in the district. Safety is, safety is a team effort. Um, there's an old adage that states it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, my version of that is it takes a village to keep a child safe. With that being said, welcome to the risky business part of your agenda. I would like to start with one of my favorite, oh, you know what? So I would like to start with one of my favorite mottos, safety is not an accident. I believe that safety is a strategic, collaborative approach to ensuring safety for students, staff, and visitors. As your new risk and safety manager, one of the first things I needed to determine was the state of, state of safety in the district. In order to do so, I performed a program audit that involved site visits and a review of policy to identify safety hazards. I also analyzed claims data to identify the types of injuries that were occurring, where they were occurring, and to what job classifications. Oh, you can't hear me with my big voice? Okay. We needed to know where the program was currently, where we needed to go, and how we were going to get there. So this is an outline of what I'll be talking to you tonight. We're going to have a workers' compensation program overview, an OSHA overview, and a review of the general safety program. So this is a snapshot of open workers' compensation claims at two points in the last school year. The initial review was done as of October 31st, and the follow-up review was done as, as of May 31st. At the initial review, as you can see, there were 168 open claims for a, for a total incurred. <laughs> for a total, I was like, boy, that was a fast 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> for a total incurred cost of $17,639,318. Um, as you take a look at the claims, open claims as of May 31st, you can see that we actually went up by five claims, but we were fortunate in the overall claims cost going down. Uh, we have a savings of $1,270,814. Um, the total incurred cost is made up of two items. It's the amount of money that's been paid on the claims and the money that is in reserves or set aside to bring those claims to conclusion. To conclusion. Um, I did a quick check today because I was just really curious to see if we were continuing a downward trend. And I was able to look at the claims as of June 30th. And I'm pleased to let you know that we are now at 169 open claims. And the costs have con continued to go down. We have an additional savings of $64,000. So this provides the big picture. But in order to develop and imp implement intervention strategies, we need to break down the data to identify areas of high frequency and high severity. These, there are three basic ways to break down claims data. One is by occupation, the second is by location, and the third is by cause. This is a breakdown of the 173 open claims by occupation. As you can see, our top five highest frequency are custodians, special education aides, regular education teachers, transportation, and food services. Now that we know our top five occupations, now that we know our top five occupations for workers' comp injuries, we need to determine what is causing those injuries so that we can develop appropriate safety interventions. Each occupation is shown here with the top injury mechanisms. As you can see, slip and falls are a common theme throughout all five occupations. So now we're going to talk about some of the workers' comp inter intervention strategies that we've already put into place. Company RN is one of the first intervention strategies that we implemented on February 5th of 2018. Company RN is a medical triage program that is an initial point of contact that is designed to provide immediate medical care to injured employees. It provides immediate notice to the risk and safety department for needed interventions. It keeps employees at work whenever possible, and it also reduces claims costs. This is a no-cost program to the district when there's a self-care or a home care referral. In the event we have to file a claim, there's a $140 fee 
but it is rolled into the cost of the claim. During the period of February 5th through May 31st, there were 100 employee injuries. In the past, before company RN implementation, our past practice was to file a claim for each injury. With the implementation of company RN, we only had to file 49 claims. So that is a 49% reduction in the amount of claims that we needed to file. The claims, out of the 49 claims that were filed during that period, we were able to close 33 of those by May 31st because of the company RN interventions, which gives us a 67% closure rate for that period of time. The estimated potential savings that you see here are reflective of the claims that we didn't have to file. So I looked at what our average cost of a workers' compensation claim was for the last school year, and I came up with an average figure of $8,000. So we didn't have to file 51 claims. So 51 multiplied by $8,000 gives us an estimated cost savings of $408,000. As stated earlier, I believe safety is a collaborative approach, and it's built on good communication. Since my arrival, I have built relationships with outside designated providers, which are WorkWell and Pinnacle, as well as our insurance team at Keenan and Associates. These are intervention strategies that have already been implemented and involve our designated medical providers, our insurance specialists, and internal PVUSD policies. Each of these elements has been added or redefined and are part of the foundation of the program. The goal is for these processes to become routine. And over time, they will continue to add value to the program. So I'm gonna focus mainly on the interventions that we've done here at PVUSD. Um, I've already spoken about the company RN implementation. In conjunction with that, we developed a defined workers work injury process so that site contacts and injured employees had a step-by-step -step instruction list of what to do. We have continued to expand our return to work program, and I also want to give a thank you to Katie Powell, the Director of Transportation, and also to Rick Ito, the, uh, pr the principal at Rolling Hills Middle School. They have been very open and very flexible and have taken almost every uh, modified duty worker that I have sent their way. The next up is the temporary modified duty agreement, which was implemented to ensure that ADA interactive meetings were being conducted for temporary work restrictions. This agreement is signed by both the employee and the supervisor to ensure the work restrictions are understood, they will be followed, and that reinforces safety. The injured worker is required to bring their doctor, doctor's notes to risk and safety after each doctor's visit so that their progress can be monitored. We're looking for the work restrictions to get less over time um, because the whole object of the return to work program is to get them back to their full capacity. So next up is a 60-day industrial leave application audit. Um, I performed an internal audit of the use of the 60-day industrial leave here at PVUSD, and I discovered that employees whose claim had been denied or put on delay for an investigation were actually receiving a front loading of 60 days of industrial pay. So under the labor code, they're not entitled to that. Um, when a claim is put on delay or when a claim is denied, um, they're, only, they're only entitled to the medical portion um, to, until that decision is made. Um, because of the front loading of that and because of the possibility of that claim being denied, what it was doing, it was actually creating situations where employees could be in overpayment situations and they would have to repay the district that money that was given to them. So to correct that situation, we have adopted a new best practice that defines when the 60-day industrial leave policy is applicable. So lastly is the Americans with Disabilities interactive meetings. And not only have we begun doing these um, with the temporary modified work agreements, but we're doing this when they have permanent work restrictions and also when there is a non-industrial um, injury. So the next steps for the workers' compensation program are to continue to develop the return to work program, just continuing to get the message out to the sites that this is a win-win for the district. It allows the employee to continue to work and be part of their work team, um, as well as the district gets the benefit um, of them contributing to the success of the district. And another benefit is the costs continue to go down. The goal for this program is 100% placement. Um, injury statistics will be sent out to the leadership team on a monthly basis, and the goal behind this is just to continue to raise awareness um, so that they're, they're aware of what's going on at their site and throughout the district. We are also going to be implementing additional safety programs. Uh, one of the first ones is going to be an automated request system for ergonomic evals. Right now, they tend to kind of fall through the cracks. 
Um, we're going to create a button on the risk and safety management page where it will direct the employee to a short survey. Um, it will give us information about their site, what their complaint is, and then it will route that directly to us so we can respond to it in a timely manner. We will be rolling out district-wide IIPT training. We will also be developing a training program for the SELPA instructional assistant um, targeted to reducing their injuries with a focus on lift technique and also just situational awareness. We're also looking at creating a monthly training schedule for the MNO and the custodial staff. So in review, this is an overview of the, pro the estimated cost savings for the 2017-18 school year. We've already identified the actual claims costs are down by $1.2 million. We have an estimated potential savings of 408,000 through the implementation of Company RN. And because we are filing less claims, and because the claims are going down, we also got a premium reduction this year of 132000 So the total estimated savings for the 2017-18 school year is $1,810,814. So the first part of the presentation really focused on the workers' compensation program, but Dr. Rodriguez wanted me to ensure that you were updated on the status of what was happening with OSHA inspections in the district. So let's start with who is OSHA anyway. Um, they are the highest safety regulatory agency in the nation. They are charged with ensuring that we have safe and healthful working conditions. They're focused on employee safety. They have the authority to come in and shut down a workplace, a school site, a district office, if they deem that there are potential safety hazards that require that. OSHA sets some of their own standards, but they also collaborate with other outside agencies and enforce their codes. One of those examples is the National Fire Protection Association. Another example would be CDC, um, EPA, and air quality districts. So we know that OSHA's focus is on employee injuries, but we also know that employee safety aligns with student safety. An employee safety hazard is most commonly also a student safety hazard. We've already talked about the collaboration with outside regulatory agencies. Um, general, the general housekeeping standard is one of the most referenced OSHA codes and states the following. All places of employment, passageways, storerooms, service rooms, and walking services are to be kept in a clean, orderly, and sanitary condition. This is a very broad standard that, that affects the entire district. Employee training is also a high priority for OSHA, and if an employer cannot produce documentation of training, OSHA will assume that it didn't happen. So Cal OSHA inspections are initiated by three general uh, areas. Um, the first is employee complaints. This is the most common. The second is by a serious injury, and the final is by regulated or focused inspections. So over the last school year, PVUSD has had five active OSHA investigations. These four were not on-site inspections, and we received no violations or citations for any of these, in any of these um, complaints. So the first happened at H.A. Hyde, and it was centered on the placement of new portables that occurred in July of 2017. There were HVA concerns and lead abatement concerns um, that were submitted by an employee. So we submitted 54 pages of documentation to OSHA, including pictures of the site, uh, the preparation work that had gone into it, inspection records, testing records. Um, they reviewed all of that and they came back, they closed the, the claim and again, there were no violations. So it was opened in September of 2017 and we were actually able to close it the following month. The second complaint came in from Rolling Hills Middle School and it was centered again on HVAC concerns. Particularly, we were told that an employee felt their room was too cold. So the first thing we did in this one is, is that we looked at the work order listing for Rolling Hills Middle School to see if there were any open work orders, and we found none. So we went over that day after we, re we received a letter, and we checked out the room, and it appeared to be functioning fine. Um, so the corrective action that we took here was we submitted the work order listing to OSHA, and we also changed the start time of the temperature so the heat would start earlier in the morning, and we had no further complaints. Um, the third complaint up here is actually a piggyback on the first Rolling Hills Middle School. Um, it was another, it was a complaint about they didn't feel that there was enough warm water at the site or that there were adequate hand washing facilities. 
Um, we were able to provide a code that actually stated that we couldn't have the warm water because it was a, a safety hazard to the students. Um, and we also were able to demonstrate that we had adequate hand washing um, facilities. So that was opened in February 2018 and was actually closed the following month. The final um, violation here or the citation was through Diamond Tech and this was related to an employee who felt that they had not received adequate training to operate a piece of heavy equipment. So what we did there is we just, we took the piece of equipment away. Um, we pulled the employee back and provided training to them. We submitted all the, that documentation to OSHA. They accepted it. The employees went back out and the job uh, continued. So that was opened in March of 2018 and was closed in April of 2018. So we weren't so lucky at Alianza. This was an on-site investigation. Um, I was in my office on December 21st and I received a call from the site that there was an OSHA inspector on the site. So I immediately went. Um, in this case, we were not provided with any information related to the actual nature of the complaint. However, through the inspection process, the above items, beca it became obvious that these were the high priority items for the inspection. Through this extensive five month on-site inspection period, there were four on-site visits, numerous phone calls, emails, submitting requested information. And the closing conference was finally held um, on May 10th of 2018. So I'm a believer in a picture tells a thousand words. So these are um, before and after shots of some of the high priority items that came out of the inspection process. So we actually started the inspection in room two. And there were two concerns in here. There were some loose tile on the floor that were suspected to contain asbestos. And there was a broken window that had not been repaired. So we were easily able to repair the broken window. Um, there were also concerns in the staff room about asbestos in the flooring there. So we had to close both of them down and initiate testing processes. Um, the staff room test came back as negative. So we basically just had to replace the carpeting there and we were open to we were able to open the staff room fairly quickly. We weren't so lucky in, in room two. Um, the test came back that did show that there was asbestos in the tile, so we had to do a full abatement process. Um, and then we cleaned it and we, we relayed tile, but we were able to get it back open as of March 22nd. So the second one that became a big issue were fire extinguisher inspections. So we are required to inspect our fire extinguishers on a monthly basis. And there were several at the site that did not have every month tag. Um, so what we did to correct this is we developed standard operating procedure number four, which is basically a monthly inspection schedule for fire extinguishers and also other pieces of equipment. Um, and it's, they are conducted throughout the district now during the same time period every month. They are to be completed on or before the first Friday of the month. And they're done in conjunction with plant operations leadership. That is marked as ongoing just because I can't close that one out because it is an ongoing process. Uh, missing ceiling tiles were also noted. That was a really easy fix. We just put them in and it was, it was taken care of. Um, the electrical hazards were, were common throughout the facility. This one actually centered on um, the outlets that were near the sinks. He did not feel that we had adequate protection and we were required to install GFCI, which is basically a ground fault circuit interrupter. It stops. Um, Mr. Sandoval can give us more information on that later. That's not my area of expertise. But anyway, those have all been replaced at the site. When the, we had the first, the, the first uh, inspection, he brought up heaters as a concern. However, as we walked through the site, we couldn't find one heater that wasn't working. So basically what we did at that point in time was we just showed him our preventive maintenance schedule and our cleaning schedule, and we were able to mark that item complete. Uh, fire hazards were a great concern at the site, and this is really a district-wide problem. Um, he pointed out that we were in violation of fire code because we had over 20% of our walls covered with combustible materials. Um, this is also marked ongoing because, it, again, it is a district-wide concern. Um, we have to come up with a solution, and we're working with leadership to do that. So the boiler room was one of my favorite parts of that little inspection process. Um, we went in there and the top picture that you see was what we saw when we first walked in there. So this is an active boiler in the corner. It has an ignition source. Within three inches of it, there was a, a ton of combustible material. 
We also walked in there, and there were either five or six desks in there. So it was very obvious that this was being used as an office space, which it was not deemed for that space. So we were told that we needed to correct it. Uh, we have done that, as you can see by the follow-up picture. Uh, the desks are no longer there. The combustible materials are moved. And it's being used for a boiler room and a storage room. There were many, many tripping hazards on the facility. At the facility, uh, asphalt potholes um, and uneven pavement, those have all been completed. The biggest one is here, and you can see the picture. Is, it's kind of hard to see, but it's a, a fairly large pothole. And again, it's the before and after. The play field had a standing pond of water in it when we were there. And we discovered it was because drainage was coming from the street onto the site. Uh, we have rerouted the drainage, and that is no longer an issue. Um, so that is also complete. So this was another one um, that was very prevalent throughout the site. And this is also a district-wide concern. Um, electrical cords and personal appliances are not only a fire hazard, but they can present a tripping hazard. If you look at the picture in the top right-hand corner, that is my favorite, room two. We just had all kinds of things going on in room two. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see that there is a piggybacking going on, uh, daisy chaining of a uh, surge protector, uh, an extension cord, and a personal electrical appliance, all strung over a sink, uh, a water source for electrocution. Um, OSHA did not like that at all. Uh, he basically looked at me and he said, do you see anything you don't like? And I said, yes, I do. So on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see this was a storage area that had been turned into an office area. Again, um, a non-compliant use of the space. And you can see front and center a space heater. Um, again, they are not allowed because they are a fire ignition source. The thing that you can't see in here is there was also some personal furniture that had been brought in. Um, and he went over to that and took a look at that and discovered that it did not meet the flammability requirement and basically told us that we needed to remove it. Um, the other picture on the bottom left-hand corner is just another example of a trip and fall hazard, uh, just a mess. This is ongoing as well um, because this is, this is a, a district-wide problem and we need to work with uh, leadership to develop an interne intervention policy. So one of the first things an OSHA inspector will do when he comes onto a site is he will find an unsuspecting employee Somebody, maybe it's the food service person, maybe it's the custodian, maybe it's the site principal, and he will ask them, do you have an IIPP? Which stands for an Injury and Illness Prevention Plan. We have re been required to have one since 1991, and we do. However, the two people that were asked this question at this site could not answer it and could not tell him where it was located. So I arrived to the opening conference about a half an hour after it already started. And I came on site, and it was the first question he asked me. And I said, of course we do. And I told him where it was. And he looked at me, and he said, this person and this person did not know where it was. Those are repeat violations. So if you have one person that doesn't know, and then you find another person that doesn't know, it just snowballs. It becomes a repeat violation. He also told us that, um, backing up with the trip and fall hazards, uh, the potholes, the cords, he has put us on formal notice that if he has to come back to this district for any reason, so an employee could call for any reason, he walks into that site and he sees one slip and fall hazard, he will consider it a repeat offense because we have been put on notice that we need to fix it. So uh, yeah, when OSHA comes to town, it's kind of a serious, it's a serious thing. Um, the emergency notification system was also a concern here and the windows in the C wing were also a concern. Um, the windows in C-Wing, what the issue was there is, is that we walked into the rooms and you could see that there were little white tags that had been put on the windows. So we went over to take a look at what they said and it said, do not open. So he said to us, he goes, do you have any idea why, why these are marked, do not open? We said, no. So we went outside and we were able to determine from the outside, there was some dry rot going on at the bottom there. Um, so we were required to do some abatement immediately. We put a fence on the outside to prevent anybody from getting close to that. And then we put plywood on the inside to avoid those panes from falling in on the kids. Um, I'm pleased to report, I understand that as of Monday, there has been a fix done to this window bank and the plywood has come down. And I've also been told that there is one functional window in every classroom in that wing. 
So the total cost of correcting the hazards identified through this OSHA inspection totaled $53,755. Um, the reason it's really that low is because we were fortunate to have our own maintenance team um, complete the majority of the work. And again, I would like to thank Dr. Rodriguez for your support during that entire process and Mr. Sandoval and his team for his ongoing support and commitment uh, to completing the work orders. So these are implementations that have been done. Um, they were, st some of them started and completed during the inspection process and some of them are ongoing. Um, I'm, we developed a standard operating procedure for site theft to follow in the event that an ocean inspector comes to the site. We also developed standard operating procedure number four, which is really related to maintenance of all those items that are listed there. Uh, we reprioritized the Measure L project list. We will be implementing district-wide IIPP training uh, so that every employee knows what that is. And then uh, we have to look at the safety committee and how it's structured. So one of the things that um, OSHA did is they asked for numerous policies and plans. And one of those was our IIPP. They also reviewed all of the prior safety committee meeting minutes that are posted on our website. Through that process, I was informed that they felt that we were not in compliance with our own plan and that we had an ineffective safety committee. Um, basically, in the IIPP, it clearly states that it will be rotational and it's to be multifunctional. So when he reviewed the membership, it had been the same people for probably five plus years. Um, so he said to me, he goes, you're not, even you're not even following your own plan. And I said, I've only been here for three months. I'm gonna be looking at this. We're gonna be, we're gonna be restructuring it. So one of the things that we did do to bring the committee into compliance is we added key departments to the committee, such as SELPA, transportation, food services, site administration, workers comp, human resources, and an M&O. Um, we do have a schedule for the 2018-19 school year, and our IIPP does say that we will meet on a quarterly basis. It does not say that we would meet on a monthly basis. So right now, we're just waiting to finalize the um, membership, and we are ready to go. So fire hazards are common concerns for many, many regulatory agencies. Some of them are listed here, Fire Marshal, OSHA. Keenan also looks at this when they come and do our periodic annual inspections. These are grouped to show you that fire hazards are really, it's a dual responsibility. There's a, there's a responsibility at the district level, but there is also a responsibility at the site and staff level. So I neglected to put some of the things up here that we had already done um, in the 2017-18 school year um, under the general safety programs. Uh, we have developed a hazard communication program and we have initiated uh, chemical safety training, which we're required to do. We had our first session in March of 2018, and we just had another session yesterday. Um, we were able to submit complete site safety plans for all of our schools for the first time in several years, and the County Office of Education actually called me and thanked me for doing that. Um, so those are some major milestones that we had in 2017-18. And for 2018-19, we are looking at doing these items. So we want to develop specific identification badges for visitors to, that come to the site. Right now, we just have a generic badge, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, we are going to develop a consistent district-wide visitor sign-in procedure. We are going to develop an internal periodic inspection process that has a documented form that goes along with it. One of the things that they say when OSHA comes to visit you, you kill them with documentation. Um, unfortunately, for our internal periodic inspection process, I didn't have anything to give them. I could tell them that we were doing it, but I had nothing to, pro nothing to provide to them. We are also going to be implementing training on the work order or the school dude program. Uh, this will also, this was a concern of theirs. Um, they didn't feel that we had trained our staff well enough on the, on the process, and um, they didn't feel that a lot of the work orders were attended to. Um, but part of that process was we found out that they weren't just being, they weren't being closed. The work had been done, but the maintenance folks had not gone in and actually closed out the work order. We are going to develop a district-wide lockdown procedure, and we are going to develop a master calendar for the drills. We are going to develop a compliance rate for mandated trainings, such as IIPP, mandated reporter, um, other trainings that we're required to do. 
Uh, we have been doing them, but again, I have no way to show that we, are, uh, that we have a compliance rate for those programs. We are going to develop department and program specific training programs. Um, I mentioned some of those to you already, the SELPA Instructional Aid Program. Uh, we are going to meet with Keenan and with the SELPA director on Monday, and we have a plan that we're hoping to roll out that training before the school starts. Uh, the other thing I neglected to tell you on School Dude, we actually have training scheduled for July 27th, July 30th, and July 31st, so we're moving forward on that as well. And then we're just going to continue to audit systems and facilitate collaboration um, to, to further enhance safety at uh, PVUSD. So, uh-oh. Oh, there we go. So on the left-hand side, this is an example of the generic visitor badge that's in use at most of the sites throughout the district. Um, you can see there's really no way to identify what site they're at. It doesn't have a visitor name. Um, there's really no way to track anything there. So this is what we're going to be moving to. It's going to have the, the school logo, or the district logo, the school logo, the school name, and it's going to require the visitor to, to put their name on there, the date of their visit, the location at the site where they're going. So if they're going to the cafeteria, we will be able to track them to the cafeteria. And then the, the visitor's pass uh, expiration date, which really should be the date of the visit. I can't think of too many situations where there would be you know, two or three days. Um, but that is already, that process has already started. I've been working with Rich Ariano and um, Nick down in um, the warehouse to start printing these and we're going to, we intend to roll those out at the beginning of the school year. Yes. So in conclusion, thank you. <laughs> in conclusion, we've completed a full circle and we're back to where we started. Um, safety is not an accident. It's a collaborative, strategic, ongoing process. A good safety program is always analyzing plans, injury trends, and on-site inspection information to correct safety hazards and provide a safer work and learning environment. By providing education, we empower our employees to become safety champions. They can identify safety hazards in their work environment before an event occurs. This helps students, staff, and visitors have a safe experience while on our sites. So said another way, oops. <laughs> safety is a structured, strategic, analytical approach focused on eliminating hazards to enable learning and ensure safe working environments. Thank you for your time and make every day a safe day. Thank you very much. So do we have any speakers to this item? None. Okay. Um, Questions, comments from the board? Very nice job. Thank you. Um, do we know, is there a process in place so employees have a way to contact us of safety issues before they go to OSHA? Yes. They should be. The site council is one of those ways. Uh, we encourage them to report safety hazards immediately to their site administrator. Um, they can also call me. Uh, I'm, av I'm available. Uh, so there are multiple ways. Um, we're also looking at possibly imp implementing an anonymous safety suggestion tool um, that would be computerized. Again, it would be a button on the website where they could go and just uh, fill it out. Um, but yes, there are multiple ways that they can do that. Thank you, Alicia. That could be a piece of the puzzle. That what I hear is if, if an employee is going to OSHA, they don't feel like they're being heard, they don't feel like, feel like they're be, the issues are being addressed. If they have a way to address them in-house, mm -hmm. we can fix it before it gets elevated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi there, fascinating presentation. Thank you. Glad you're on board with PVUSD. I think you're a great addition. Um, I have a couple of questions. So sort of on, along the same lines of what Jeff was saying, um, aside from waiting for people to report in issues on the campuses, I mean, we have just come out of a very difficult budgeting cycle for the last 10 years, and now we're rebuilding our budget. So, it, so a lot of these things got put on hold just because we didn't have the budgets, and we really still don't to, to fix these things. But we, sh we, we should be on top of it, and we have to fix some obvious problems. Mm -hmm. So is there something that 
we could be doing or that we're training like our site administration like our principal is like the buck stops with the principal to walk the facility with somebody from M and O and custodial like at the beginning like at certain points along the year so that these issues do not persist and have to be complained about I'd like to get them taken care of ahead of the complaint right that is the intent of the periodic inspection process and uh, we're kind of toying with how we want to do that one suggestion was exactly what you said where the site administrator would walk the site with the custodian um, OSHA wants to see it on a regular basis um, one of the things that they suggested to us was a monthly basis um, so we're toying with that and we're also looking at possibly designating a specific maintenance and operations person um, to really become the expert and just really take that on and own that process um, throughout the district that would be great um, because really when I look at those photos it's shocking to me that we've got you know things daisy chained and this surge protector over a sink where children are washing their hands like that is unacceptable and we can't let that continue so it seems like there's lots of adults in charge at every one of those sites that should be seeing that and saying what are we doing here mm -hmm. Yeah, so I look forward to the improvements. So let's talk about asbestos for a second because, of course, it's shocking to this board that we've got children playing in classrooms where there's asbestos. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing as a district to make sure that that is not the case in any of our facilities ever again? So the first thing you need to remember about as asbestos, it's it probably very preval prevalent throughout the district just because of the age of the construction of the buildings. Um, it's my understanding, and Victor can correct me if I'm wrong on this, that it was very prevalent in a lot of building materials up to the mid-80s. Um, asbestos is not a hazard unless it's broken and becomes friable. And also it has to be a very large exposure over an extended period of time. So if somebody just walks over a broken tile with one exposure, they're probably not going to have any ill effects from that. But if it would be a situation where we had possibly a construction project going on, for a long period of time and we were pulling up asbestos tiles or whatever, um, that could possibly be a safety hazard, but we would know that in advance and we would prepare for that. Okay, so when I hear that there's asbestos broken tiles on the floor and children aren't just walking over it once, but that are likely playing on top of it daily for years, classroom after classroom after classroom, that doesn't make me feel good as a board member, a parent, a citizen. So um, I, I guess what I'm asking for is um, that we take a look at this and, and do something about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to know that we're really digging down in this, and I, I do agree with Trustee DeSerpa. Um, has there been a formal assessment of the asbestos um, in our schools, and, and do we know where there's any um, ha hazards, as you said, with broken tiles or whatnot? We do have a formal process. It's called the AHERA report, and we actually just got those back. Um, we have a consultant that helps us with that, and it's a, a three-year um, periodic inspection of a very deep inspection and then they come back and verify every six months to really look at the state of the, of the asbestos. Um, so we do have that program in place. Um, in all honesty, the, what happens in the classroom really needs to go back to a work order being filed. Um, we had no work order in this room uh, where this tile was found. So they had been in that room for a period of time. We don't even really know how long and no one had filed a work order. So it really goes back to educating the staff about the work order system and really impressing upon them that it's their responsibility to notify us. Correct. And the site the inspection with the, um, the principal on a regular basis will, um, he would see those, he or she would see those things and check to see if the work orders were there. Yes. Okay, so that's good. I'm glad that we do have that. Um, I had a couple other questions that came up. What is, um, Industrial leave? Industrial leave is under the education code. You, If you are injured in the course of your employment and you are completely unable to return to work, so the doctor has said you need to be off work, you need to be on leave, that's industrial leave. Cool. Okay. Um, the um, rerouting of the drainage 
from the street onto the site. Is that our responsibility or wouldn't that be the county? Well, who paid Mr. for that? Mr. Sandoval. <laughs> Can I defer that question yes, to him? Yes, you may. <laughs> Hi, Victor. Um, unfortunately, uh, the location that we're talking about is a rural area. It's never been modified. My kids went to school there when it was South Sepoides. Yeah, <laughs> well, just the name alone <laughs> says it all. Um, unfortunately, we're at the bottom of a hill, and the natural drainage is coming towards us. It's not by fault of the county. It's not by fault of anything. It's the natural drain, and it just hasn't been improved at any given time. But throughout the years, what's been happening is when houses go up, there is runoff. And naturally, it runs towards the street. And since we're lower than the street, that's the problem that we have. So okay. eventually, we need to put in a diverter to go around the school. So I would like it if we worked with the county on that, because it's not our property. And we should not have to do that. True. So um, I mean, being a good neighbor and keeping good relationships and working together yeah. to make it happen. But I don't think that it should be 100% out of our pocket or maybe not even any any of it. I don't know. But that's definitely something that um, we know we've had to do some upgrades on their property recently. So <laughs> we can we should look into that. Um, um, so you, you talked a lot about the new processes that are, are put in place. Um, I mean, I'm hope I see in what horrible shape this one school got into because of the age of it and our budget constraints. But I'm hoping that these new processes that you're putting in place are, are going to avoid that happening in the future. If we keep up on it, we should never get there again. Is that correct? I'm hoping so too. Okay. Um, how often on this new safety committee makeup, mm -hmm. um, it's our plan that says that the ro that it has to be a rotating basis. Right. Um, how often is it in our plan that the current those recommendation seats? is every two years? And okay. uh, I just want to remind you that that's been in that plan um, ever since it was developed, which okay. I'm going to assume it went into effect in 1991. Okay. Um, I don't really have a strong opinion on that either way but I do know like uh, for us as a board we have standing committees that we serve on and sometimes we'll serve on them for a year or two and then move on to another one or eight years um, or ten but when we do move on it gives us an opportunity to maybe serve somewhere else mm -hmm. and um, it's for me it's it helped me learn more about the district mm -hmm. and you know what what's going on and I think that that can be a real benefit so I don't know what the downside would be but just m wanted to find out what that recommendation was mm -hmm. and lastly my last question is the 400,000 in mm -hmm. savings where does that savings go I mean I know we're trying to free up money so we can help with raises and deferred maintenance and things like that but um, your you're doing such great work and these savings are coming from the sites directly i would love to see a portion of it going back into deferred maintenance so we can help avoid schools becoming in such bad conditions that it's a safety issue great idea so, so anyway. we do have one comment so okay. uh, going back to the safety committee so the rotating clause that we have in our policy in the um, IIPP. Thank you. Um, does that apply only to uh, district personnel, or does it also apply to, let's say, PVFT? Because they did bring up a good point that it's it's in their contract. It's uh, in their contract that they have two representatives, and they are allowed to pick those, but they do fall under the rotational part of the plan. Um, it is also, uh, for instance, Victor is currently sitting on the committee to represent MNO in two years, he will need to select somebody from his department to take his place. Really, the only position that can't rotate off that is me. Okay. Um, so something that we have found in the last two years since I've been here is conflicting documents. And so that is 
similar to what we're seeing now, meaning that we had plans, um, resolutions um, that were created and then really never fully implemented. And because they were never fully implemented, it didn't become ingrained into the fabric of what we did. So therefore, um, whether it was contractual language or it was other plans or other policies started to come into conflict with our own documents. So this is another example of where we have two sets of documents that are both legally binding that are in conflict with each other. So it's, it's a challenge, but it's um, what we have to do. And I know that, um, that Sheila is willing and dedicated to do it is just um, continue the collaboration and work and negotiate, right? Try to figure out the win-win. The and I do believe that we can get there. Right? It's like what can both sides um, come to an agreement so that we can have an IIPP that is, um, you know, is usable and works for OSHA and all the other things that we need it for, and then it also works for our staff. Um, but um, we, we do have many um, examples of that where our own documents are in conflict with each other. So, so there was a, you said there was going to be or there has been about four hundred thousand dollars in savings, uh, one point eight, yeah, right, total. total. So I would actually like to see that go back to facilities. Um, I, I really do because they're deteriorating, um, and I'm so glad that we have this position in place. I know there was some opposition to hiring someone to look into, to be in charge of risk management, but I'm so glad that we did it uh, because our students deserve better. And staff too, of course, and um, I always say this, you, we shouldn't put a price on student safety or staff safety for that matter. So I'm really happy um, with the work that you've done up to this point, but I would really, would love to see that 1.8 go back to facilities. And I just have one follow-up question from your slide on um, company RN, or maybe it's an OSHA slide or something. In terms of benchmarking to other districts that are similar, similarly sized, are our claims or our um, accidents um, higher, the same, lower? So we're a member of a, J a JPA, which is a Joint Powers Authority. And there are multiple uh, school districts in that JPA that are similar in size and makeup to ours. Unfortunately, I do have to tell you that our claims are actually, we're at the top of the leaderboard, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, our claims are the highest in the JPA, and that's not where we want to be. And, and can you give me like a percentage of how much higher? Or? I don't really have that figure that's with okay. me. I'm just um, curious. I can, I can talk to Keenan and, and get an estimate for you. Um, get that to Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Having that information would be great because that way, you know, we can set a goal for where we want to be in the next one, three, five years to, to bring that down. So thank you. Very, are there any other comments or questions? No. Thank you very much. Good presentation. Good work. Okay. We're going to move to item 8.2, yeah. our education equity audit. And this is, <laughs> um, yes, so a report that will be given by our superintendent. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll try to stay to my 10 minutes and be as less verbose as possible. Um, so I just wanted to read, you've seen this slide. Um, it's a theory of action. Um, basically, this is just an overview slide where it shows how we went through the education equity audit, which I'm going to go through in a minute. Um, that resulted, um, everyone, um, it is online, so you guys can go on our district website. It's in English and Spanish on there. Um, expanded cabinet will be receiving it. Um, we, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so um, then it, it, le it led to the blueprint action planning, which is what you were going to be reviewing today. And just know that all of this is actually encapsulated already in our LCAP. And so we have already began to allocate funding associated with, with all of these. So it's really important and one of the beauties and I think power of the equi education equity audit is the collaborative process and development that we went through. So each and every school, middle school, high school, and each and every alternative school from PCCS to new school, every school um, to our comprehensive high schools, um, district director, coordinators, and cabinet were involved with every single meeting that was there. So it included um, staff, which included an EL specialist, a special education teacher, a counselor, um, and a general education teacher, and then um, the principal and assistant principal. Um, so we had teams of eight from each high school, and we had teams of six from each middle school. So it was a large group, and we did have um, a steering committee um, that included our very own uh, Ms. Orozco as well. Um, that was present, and um, Ms. DeSerpa um, came, come, came as well to support the, the team in the development. So um, we had a lot of um, staff participation in this. This you cannot read, so I'm just going to move forward. If you would have been able to read it, or if you want to read it on your screen, um, basically the most important piece is the fact that we remained um, on schedule. So we, what we did is we backwards mapped. We wanted to be able to start at the fall of 2018, and so then we backwards mapped all of the um, meetings in order to be able to bring this to you um, to, in essence, um, be approved. Um, so this one, I don't expect you to read that. It is a visual imprint. Um, so if you look at um, this document right here, um, what I want to direct your attention to is the back of the document, which is the 2018-19 LCAP goals. These are very important because we went through a process of redefining the LCAP goals to make them a little bit more rigorous than they had been previously um, because we've grown and we've expanded from the way that we have. So one that I want to um, speak to is like the, the third one, which is a visual and performing arts. So originally, our visual and performing arts goals the goal itself was that our students would have access to a credentialed VAPA teacher. We're way past that now, where we have credentialed VAPA teachers in there. So instead, we transform that goal to be demonstrating an appreciation for the arts through access and selection of a variety of high quality visual and performing arts courses. So with each and every one of them, and I'm gonna talk about one more, with each and every one of them, then we really ramped them up. So we didn't, we wanted to make sure that it was representative of the direction that we've already gone and the direction that, that we're going. So the one that I wanna speak to last, because it leads into this next piece, is the one up top. Um, and so originally we just had it that students would score um, proficient on the SBAC. Um, and so that, that isn't really where we want to go anymore because we talk frequently about our high-end students as well, right? And we really talk about, it's not just about um, high school, but it's also about um, post-secondary and really ensuring that students have the A through G coursework. So we transitioned that LCAP goal to be about students that are performing at or above grade level and completing A through G coursework to prepare all students to graduate from PBUST ready to enter into a four-year college or career. And again, we, we recognize that not all students are going to want to go to college, but what we do believe is that we should prepare them to be able to go, right? So that they make that choice of where they want to go. So they might wind up going straight into career, may go into military, may go into a two-year, all perfect choices for those individuals. But what we do know is our job is to prepare them for every option so that they can make that choice themselves. Um, and so this is the one, this is the one pager. And um, so board can look inside, because again, these are visual imprints, which is what I, what I did for you. Um, so we created this two-sheeter that I sent out to all staff um, before we left. Um, so they re received it um, at the beginning of June. 
Um, this was really important because we had about 80 people who participated um, in this process, but we have a lot of people who didn't. And so we wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of what had happened. So if you look at the left-hand side, which is the first page, the top, and I won't read any of it to you, but the top really speaks to why we did it. Right, so the top spoke to the changing demographics, the changing landscape of education and how we need to ensure kids are college and career ready. Um, the bottom piece is really, uh oh, it, it, um, it's saying that video is, um, yeah, we had that problem before too. Anyways, the, the bottom piece really speaks to what we did. So again, it speaks to how we partnered with Ed Trust West how we made sure that we did um, focus groups with our students, um, parents, how we had um, collaborative sessions with the people that I mentioned before. Um, we did surveys with all of our um, secondary students, parents, and teachers district-wide. Um, we had the steering committee that I, I mentioned earlier. And then we also, which really opened our eyes, is we did a review of every single transcript um, from 2016. What we did notice from that was our systems were so um, disparate that they had to do it by hand. So we, we had such um, differences between our high schools, between what course codes we used. We had so many issues with our transcripts that they, this, the, the team that does this for a living throughout the nation literally could not use their algorithm for ours, but had to do everything by hand. Um, and so that, that was one challenge and one reason why we, um, why we hired Carrie Goodwin, who's been doing a great job, who is our lead counselor. Um, the second page that you see over there, the three-year action plan, um, and we're gonna go over the listing of all the actions in a minute, but the, what we did is we wanted to, we knew that some people weren't going to want to look at every single list, um, and so we took the ones, we had our steering committee vote, and we had, we had a group, a task force that helped um, with the final writing, which included um, teachers and staff, and um, they selected these as the key ones that they wanted to communicate out with everyone. So on this, and if you read the top, it says it's just a sample of what, um, of what we were doing. But we wanted to make sure that everybody had the entire list. So what you'll see on this, and yes, it's bigger people that can't see the, the example, is, um, is um, what we have is for each grade level span, there are specific tasks that are, that are happening for each year. And so what I had mentioned before um, is unfortunately accurate, is we have in the past years created plans with a lot of feedback and we did not implement. So one thing that people have been really focusing on is are, after we spend all this time, are we really gonna implement? And when we developed these action steps, we made sure that everyone in the room was willing to do each and every action step because we said, if you have a problem, speak up now in your small group because we're gonna move forward with these. Um, and some, you have to move slower than others. That's why some are in year three, some are in year two, because you need an on-ramp for some. You don't need an on-ramp for others. Um, but we wanted to make sure that, that we had it. Um, each one of us has responsibilities from high school, which is in blue, middle school that's in um, turquoise, red that's in um, elementary, and then the gold or yellow is um, district level actions. Um, one of the things that you'll see in year one, if you go to the district level one, is the very first piece is align graduation requirements for world language and VAPA with A through G requirements. So that's what we're going to start talking about now. One thing, um, when we did the audit transcript of the three traditional high schools, what we noticed is only 45% of our students even enrolled in full A through G course sequence. So 55% of our students had absolutely no chance of actually getting themselves to a four-year college because they didn't even take the, the A through G course sequence. Um, and, then, and then less than a quarter completed that sequence, meaning that they didn't get a C or a C minus or better, right? So they got a D or F. And so if you can graduate with a D, but you can't go 
to um, UC with a D. You have to have a C minus or, or better. Um, and so what we did is we developed um, this form, which you'll see in here if you, if you move through. Um, one, I want to note that it says up at the top of the first one, it says class 2019 to 2022, because as I'm sure that everyone is, is, um, knows, because most everyone either has a child that's going into high school, has already crossed through high school, or is in high school currently, is, um, is that, um, well, we have one young well, that doesn't have that, but she's on her way. Um, is um, <laughs> she works at UCSC, so she knows this. Um, is that um, what we can't do is say next year's graduates have to have these requirements, right? Because they have to, not only do we have to put it in place, but then you have to make sure your freshmen start the sequence, right? So this is, this form right here is a benefit to, to students because we want, what we want them to see is what their choices are that they choose choose, how it leads to either graduation or how it leads to college, and the differences between those two, right? Um, one thing I will note, if you look at the last, the last slide, um, this slide that's right here, is we already did most of the heavy lifting in our district, actually. So most, a lot of school, well not most, but a lot of school districts only require 20 credits of math. We actually already require 30 credits of math. And we already require 30 credits of science, which most school districts only require 20, cr unit, 20 credits of science. So are actually the hardest courses are the ones that we're already in alignment with. Um, where we were off alignment was in world language, which is kind of interesting because that's where our students for both AP and even if you look at DNF rates, do the best at because that's an asset for most of our students. Um, and we weren't, so what we were requiring is before we were requiring just 10 credits of either world language or VAPA. And so what we're doing is we're realigning that so that um, by just changing world language and just changing visual and performing arts, we can get our students to be college and career ready, right? Assuming that they get the C minus or better. So we're not changing the amount of credits. It's staying at 220. What we're doing is we're reducing the elective credits. Um, we are reducing the elective credits. It's um, currently 45. Um, we are reducing that. Um, but we are, there is still voice and choice in that, right? It's like we're not saying which world language that you have to do. We're not saying which visual and performing arts class that you have to do, right? Um, but we're moving it to align, um, align it to the A through G requirements. Um, and we believe that our students will not only build on the assets of our students and the creativity of our students, but will also um, support them to be able to make choices when they graduate to do whatever they want to do. And um, so the next item, which is 8.3, is really just the first reading of the board policy. So um, if you read it, there's quite a bit that's changed, but it's really old verbiage that has come out. Um, so we took out the verbiage about Casey. We took out the verb, which is no longer, there's no longer Casey. Um, we took out some, um, we added in this verbiage right here, um, noting that kids would now um, need to do world language or as it's noted technically, which is a language other than English. That's actually what it's noted as for the UC system. Um, and so I will open it up for questions or comments. I'm not seeing speaker cards either for this one, right? Okay, great. So um, questions, comments from the board. I'll go ahead and start with Jeff. Oh, okay. Do you have anything? Okay, Kim. Dr. Rodriguez, um, so in the past we've made um, some good changes, but it caused unintentional consequences in other areas. Is there anything that we need to know about the changes that you're hoping to implement that might um, ruffle feathers or? 
So, um, you know, as I had mentioned, there was 80 people that were involved in the development, and then there are hundreds that are involved in the implementation. Right. So I'm meeting with all the site administrators, so I'm meeting on the 6th with the high school site administrators, and then the f a few days later with the middle school um, site administrators to really look at where they need supports. Um, there are a few challenges that, um, that I could see. Um, most importantly, probably it would be number, so one, two, three, four, five, the fifth bullet. Um, the fifth bullet down was something that the teachers felt strongly about. And I'm sorry, so I'm looking at the blue and I'm looking at the fifth bullet. Um, and so, for instance, that says perform weekly, um, regular weekly updates to online grade books, um, school loop by all teachers, monitor grades, and assist students. Um, I could see that being a challenge because we have um, some people that do significant updates and others that do not. Um, so I always feel that it's about um, how do we support and sometimes scaffold into those things, right? Um, but I could see that being something that could be a challenge. The rest of the, the intention of the year one was to really do, and it's kind of a, I don't know if I love the phrase, but the low hanging fruit, right? So do the quick wins, the ones that were pretty easy to implement, um, that would show a large impact on students. Um, and so of all of them, when I was doing my board and moving things through, I would say that is the most, um, the most for that. The other ones that are, that will be of challenge are going to be planning years. Um, and so for example, expand options for students to access credit recovery in A through G courses. Um, that can be a challenge. We, know, we knew that our job was to do a planning year on that so we could hear a lot of voices have a lot of information out about that before we actually do it. Um, so we'll, we, we'll be working on um, communication, collaboration, and messaging of that over next year so that then 1920 we could do a good job. Um, and then, of course, the bottom one for year one, which is um, support for all counselors and being efficient and effective. That, that again, is a planning year. So it's not um, going to be an easy fix. So what can we do to help support them and move things forward? Um, I mentioned high school just because a lot of high school is replicated in the middle school. Um, but I would say that um, the one that I mentioned, I foresee of being um, the largest challenge. Would we, would we make that a requirement then for the teachers? That's in the 18-19. So yeah, so that's exactly why we're going to be because uh, all it's always the implementation that gets you right. So um, that is why I'm meeting with the high school principals and the middle school principals in order to establish what do we do do first, second, right? How do we push on it? Sometimes you can um, like ease into it, right? So does it first become where we work with our, our sites and we first start it at monthly and then we work in, we ease into it, um, right? Um, there's a lot of things to do. We also <coughs> kind of talking with teachers ahead of time and saying what would preclude you or what is challenging about doing that and then trying to figure out what the challenges are and then doing compensation of those challenges, right? Well, I think that's the way you do it. I, th I think you, I'm not, Site administrator, but I think if you work with the site administrators and work with the teachers, show them why this is important, and ease them into it, it makes it easy for everybody because then yeah. you get buy-in. Yeah. Well, that's the that's the goal. We're not in it for the short term; we're in it for the long run for our kids. So this was this this is a lot of work. I I mean, I'm looking at this. I'm thinking about all the people that collaborated in this in making this. But when you're breaking it down into just like sound bites mm -hmm. what do you personally as the superintendent of this district hope to achieve by this so what I hope to achieve is that at each level of the organization we do concrete steps that are deliberate and purposeful to ensure kids are ready for college because they're not really now 
They're not right now. They're not now. No. Not now. Well, as you saw, 23% are ready, which isn't sufficient. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for all the good work, too. Thank you. Um, I have been waiting to hear that from <laughs> leadership at this district about every student should be ready for college, whether they choose to or not. Our job is to get them ready. And I've been saying that since before I was on the board. And it was, it almost brought a little tear to my eye to hear you say it. So that was awesome. Thank you. And w our kids can do it. I know that they can. And this, um, at, as Trustee DeSerpa said, this was a huge amount of work. And this is, this is our plan. This is our plan going forward. And we've never had something like this. So I just, I love that. Um, there's a lot of collaboration. You make sure that there's buy-in. Everybody feels included. So something's not just dropped at their feet. And this is what we're doing now because we're never going to get anywhere if we do that. And I, I, that's what I'm really um, happy about that, um, that that takes leadership. And I'm really um, interested in seeing where, where we are with these with regular progress reports. And I know that we're going to see, um, you know, positive outcomes early because that's what um, has been happening with the new initiatives. And um, this is this is kind of everything all tied up into a package, right? So I don't have any specific questions. I don't think if something comes up, you know, I'll email it to you. But this is great. And, and the um, reducing the amount of electives, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, I could see maybe some students going, well, I don't have time to take this one now, but um, there's other opportunities out there too. There's dual enrollment. You know, they can go down the street to Cabrillo or they could do online classes at another college, whatever, because um, there are other options. So anyway, congratulations. Thank you so much. And um, following on the same theme, first reading on our board policy on graduation requirements. And yes. So unless there's for the unless there's further questions, I I feel like I I cre I've covered that mm -hmm. um, through the last piece. So unless there's mm -hmm. further questions, I know that and I appreciate it. Um, they left, but CSEA caught a little air, so that's what all first readings are about. Um, and so that was great. Um, also, I am a, adult education did um, have another refinement that they wanted to touch bases with me on. Um, and so, as always, um, the board as well as um, staff, that's the reason why we do first and second readings, right? So that it gives everybody the opportunity to look at it and ensure that it is um, the way that we need to by the time we take it for a second reading. Mike's not on, I'm sorry. And monitoring health conditions. And um, this is, I don't see, here we go. Heather Gorman? Nurse oh, Nurse Goldstein. Sandra, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. I don't think it's on. Reason why is because we're televised, not to make you nervous, but okay. it won't pick up sound if you're not speaking. Anymore. You're on community TV. Oh, good. <laughs> and live streamed. Great. <laughs> That's fine. Way to go, trustee. That's fine. I've done that. I'll tell you about the times I was in the movies. Good evening, President DeRose, board members, Dr. Rodriguez. 
I am, I'm pleased to be here to talk about the use of Narcan in schools for opioid overdose. In 2016, there were over 2,000 opioid-related overdose deaths in California, a rate of 4.9 per 100,000 persons, and that number continues to increase. In 2016, President Obama proposed new funding to address the prescription opioid abuse epidemic, epidemic. And these efforts focus on th the three areas that tackle uh, opioid crisis, which significantly impact those struggling with substance abuse disorders and helping to save lives. It provides training, tools, and educational resources that healthcare professionals need to make more informed prescribing decisions when prescribing opioids uses medication-assisted treatment to help lift people out of opioid addiction and to increase the use of Noxalone or Narcan, a drug that can reverse opioid overdose. What are opioids? I'll learn this. Heroin, morphine, oxycodone, codeine, Norco, Vicodin, all things that we've all heard of and some of us have probably taken. What are the effects of these? Pain relief, euphoria, other things, but respiratory depression is the effect that we're concerned about. When people overdose on an opioid, it means they've taken too much of that substance, too much for their body. And the opioid interacts with receptors in the brain that control breathing. Breathing will slow or stop. The brain will become deprived of oxygen. The heart stops. Unconsciousness, coma, and death occur. Long-term brain, nerve, or physical damage can occur. And this isn't instantaneous. This can last, can take one to three hours after the ingestion or the patch application of the opioid. <coughs> Narcan blocks the effect of opiates and allows a person to breathe again. It's short acting. It takes 30 minutes to an hour and a half to work, depending on the health of the person and the amount of drug used. It acts only on opiate component of a multi-drug overdose. Opioid withdrawal symptoms generally are mild. The effect of the opiate may return, which is a significant concern for the long-acting um, medications. It essentially has no effects at all if the opioid is not present. And Narcan is stable at room temperature for two years. AB 635 has been in effect since 2014. It's designed to encourage California healthcare providers and community programs to widely distribute Narcan. It allows for prescription and distribution throughout the state. It protects the health care providers from civil and criminal liability with the use of Noxalone. It permits individuals to pos po possess and administer Noxalone in an emergency and protects these individuals from civil or criminal prosecution for practicing medicine without a license. The scope kit, which I have here for anyone that wants to see it later, has two nasal spray containers of Narcan. It has a single CPR, sterile, um, single-use barrier, instructions for use and disposal, and information on treatment options that are available. The pros of having Narcan in our schools is that it reverses the effects of opioids for people who have overdosed and are in respiratory distress. It can save a life when used for opiate overdose. It's safe and easy to use by trained school professionals. 
The training for the use of Narcan can take as little as five or ten minutes. A sample procedure and protocol document has been written by Santa Cruz for use by the Santa Cruz County Schools. Santa Cruz County Office of Education and our county school district have approval for the use of Narcan in county schools. Several of our PVUSD school nurses have been trained in the use of Narcan and how to train others in its use. Janice of Santa Cruz will provide Narcan kits free of charge to our school nurses and others as requested. Cons. For people who are dependent on opioids, the use of Narcan can cause withdrawal symptoms. People who regularly and are dependent upon use of opioids may become angry when the effect of it is reversed by the use of Narcan. 911 must be called after the use of Narcan. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Um, no speakers? No speakers. Okay. Jeff? Thank you so much. I, I do have a question though. I was, my, my knowledge on this is very limited. Um, but I saw that someplace where I'm assuming this situation, it's a kid who's, who's taken some, something and he's going to respiratory arrest mm -hmm. and we're, someone gives him Narcon. I thought I heard you say it takes up to 30 minutes to act, to work. No, it will last from between 30 minutes to, half, to an hour and a half. It works instantly. It's a nasal spray that we have. So it works instantly to, to get that, that child? Instantly. Through the emergency. Okay, and then we call 911 we go from there, correct? And then? We call 911 we go from there. Yes. So, and this is available at other school districts across the county? I know right now it's been summer, so I haven't been caught up, but I know Santa Cruz City Schools is using it. Okay. Have we had any, op uh, any deaths from this at the district, at district site? Not that I know of. Oh, I'm sorry. You would know better than I. No, but we d there was one in Salinas last year, a 14-year-old. Yeah, it's in our backyard. Yeah. It, uh, thank you. It it, that's true. And there are accidental overdoses. For example, a parent can give a child with an ear infection one of their Vicodin, not knowing that it's too much of a dose and too strong of a drug for an elementary school student who also maybe has a cough, so they also give a cough medicine with codeine, drop the child off at school, and in an hour, the child goes into uh, respiratory depression or arrest. So it hasn't happened, but it's, no, no, no. I mean, I'm just saying there are things that can happen. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think this is great. I think we should all support this. I carry a kit with me. It at my job and I've been trained to use it with the patients that I work with yeah that exact kit it's very easy you just mm -hmm. it's a nasal spray you just deploy it and reverses immediately the, the issue I'm, I'm happy to hand this and you can pass it and look at it mm -hmm. if you want to while other things are going on sure in banking we don't see this kind of stuff too often thank you <laughs> oh gosh just so thank you for coming tonight and presenting. Okay. And I hope nobody ever has. That's my hope as well. Um, no, Jeff, ask the questions. I think that's really what all of our questions, or, um, all of us had that similar question. Has that ever happened on our campus? Not even from a cough syrup over to, because the first thing I go to is someone who's got an addiction problem and but, but I don't think we, hopefully, I don't think we have a lot of that going on. But when you started talking about an overdose, accidental overdose by a parent giving a child, I could see, I, I'm actually surprised with the number of students we have that that has not happened. Um, but, you know, it, having something on hand um, in case that does happen um, and we could save a life, potentially, having this in front of us and um, saying no to it and then something happens tomorrow or next month and we had said no, 
I, I don't see any down. Is there a downside? Let me ask you that question. The only downside is that if a person is dependent on an opiate, that they can have some of the um, side effects of sweating, chills, um, nervousness, mm -hmm. anger, at coming being brought out of their opiate state. Mm -hmm. However, we are there. There is um, the policy. It's would it be policy that we would have to contact nine one one immediately after? Always. Okay, so they would get treatment yeah. right away for those symptoms as well. Correct. Probably. Yeah. Is that what happens? Uh huh. And they can treat those those symptoms too. So it's not like. Yeah, okay. there are medications that can treat those symptoms. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So this this was um, a first reading, right? Okay. So then, what happens next? Um, Thank you, Sandra. It, um, we did receive a little bit of feedback from CSEA on one slight addition that they would like to make um, to it, um, and then if we have any other suggestions on the board policy wording, we would do that. Um, at the second reading, we could ask um, Sandra to come back, but the, the thought was that she wouldn't come back unless it was a board request that we would ask any questions that you had of her um, tonight. But you, we can bring her back. Um, at the August 22nd board meeting is when um, we would um, put it in as board policy, and then we would begin um, using it shortly after that. And the pictures are there. They are. Mm -hmm. And we thank that we really thank Janice of Santa Cruz for offering this as a community service. There's a coalition of members, not just at Janice, but in from PAMP and Dignity and uh, many areas that are working on this um, addiction issue together. And so this is one of the things that we're doing to try to save people's lives. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we're moving on to action items. We have quite a bit here. Um, at item 9.1 is um, approval of an MOU regarding work calendars for 18, 19, and 1920. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know this. We'll, we'll have to take a break until Trustee Ursino gets back, and I think he's coming. So um, we have to have quorum in order to move forward. We're waiting on you, Jeff. <laughs> No. Okay, great. So, um, item 9.1 is uh, uh, approval of a MOU regarding work calendars for 1819 and 1920 between PVFT and PVUSD. Uh, yes, thank you, President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Last spring, the board approved student calendars for the next three years, beginning with the 2018-19 school year. In May, a contract was signed with PVFT, um, which was negotiated and included two additional work days for all of our employees represented by PVFT. One was a teacher work day, and another day was a training day. Um, in support of the employees he represents, um, PBFT uh, President Francisco Rodriguez worked with us to, to place the two additional days uh, to balance the educational needs of our students and the calendar as well as PBFT's rights to work here. Um, we were able to come up with a good solution for 2018 and 19 as well as 2019 to 20, uh, the first two years without any disruption to the students' calendars and any kind of changes. Um, however, for 2020, that was a little bit harder um, because it is one of those weird years where the holidays fall at different. So what we had agreed to is we would take that back to the calendar committee, um, which includes uh, PBFT representatives, um, CSEA representatives, as well as district um, and site um, administrators, and try to work out a, a calendar 
um, that is not disrupt that that serves the students' best educational interests as well as respects the rights of PBFT. Okay, great. And I see no speakers to this item. Um, so, are th there any questions or comments from the board? Okay, so I'll um, a move approval I'll of the sec MOU. I'll second that motion. Aye. Aye. Um, hearing none of those motions have been carried unanimously. Um, our next item is the approval of a tentative agreement with our Communication Workers mm -hmm. of America, also known as CWA. Also referred to as a small off. Okay. My button. Sometimes it goes off. Sorry about that. So this is approval of um, a tentative agreement with Communication Workers of America, also known as CWA. And uh, being submitted for a review by the PBUSD Governing Board of Trustees. And the, the uh, items that were updated was the wages and the term of the agreement. Um, this is the last of the contract negotiations um, that we have for at least a year um, and not looking into until 2019 to 2019-2020. Uh, 2020. So the symbolism is at least um, some piece uh, from negotiations. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Did you hear that, Francis? <laughs> that's great. Um, and I think that's the first time in forever since I've been here that we weren't, I think we were constantly in negotiations. So um, this is nice. I'm glad we got to settle all of our contracts. Um, seeing no speakers, is there any uh, questions, comments? Okay, would like to make a motion? I'd actually have a, just a couple of comments. I'm very, very happy to see that our substitute teachers are going to be paid better wage than what they had been. I feel like um, we'll be able to um, recruit a higher quality substitute now to our district. Um, it very briefly, can can you just talk about the different tiers? With your mic on. Um, we have uh, three different tiers. One is just the, 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 the uh, substitutes that come in for a day. And then we have the second tier, which are substitutes. So, Dr. Colleen, sure. so just for, because this is going to be broadcast out to the general sure. public if anyone's watching community TV. So, I want to actually say this some, if we could. So, for tier one, that's just somebody's, a teacher is sick and a sub comes in. For the day. It is now $140 a day. Yes. Or if it's a half day, $70. $70. Okay, tier two. Uh, tier two, uh, this is for people that are there um, for a little bit longer, and uh, it that's going up to $180 a day. And so for a little bit longer, like maybe they had surgery? Uh, uh, more or than 11 days. Okay. More than 11 days. So $180 per day or $90 yes. for a half day. Okay. Yes. And then the tier three is our long-term sub. We have people that go on um, leave, long-term leave like FMLA or maternity. Um, that takes a little bit of time. And so that substitute is um, having to do lesson plans and working on grading with administrators. So they are at $200, and that is the highest in, you know, in our area. That's yes. what we wanted to hear. So we are now the highest in the whole county yeah. yeah okay great thank you that's great news it wasn't too long ago that we were the lowest is that correct I, I think it's um, unless they had negotiated you know with their teachers as well so I I will I will bring you accurate figures and, and get that to dr. Rodriguez okay. thank you. but as of when we approved this which was uh, a while back um, we we were very competitive Yes. Has, is this, uh, I'm not seeing the signs as much as I used to, I haven't noticed them at least, looking for substitutes. Is this helping to build our bank of substitutes? Definitely, definitely. That's, and that's exactly what we're looking for, so that we can get the best possible people in the classroom. Thank you. Um, just one last question, I do have one. 
Uh, in regards to professional development, at least for our long-term subs, would that be addressed anywhere in the contract? For professional development, uh, yes, we do. Um, we are work. Uh, we do want to um, work with the sites and make sure that uh, the long-term subs are involved in um, professional development, and they they go through that like the teachers, because especially if they're going to be there with the students for a while, we want to make sure that they are current in the practices that we have in the district. Move approval. Aye. Thank you. Is it still off? Thank you. Should I repeat that so it's recorded? Okay. So I'm going to ask for the vote again. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And seeing none opposed, item, item passes four zero three. Great. Okay. Item nine point three, and that is um, Dr. Colleen again. This is um, approval of an MOU between Alliant International University and PVUSD. Uh, yes, President DeRose, we work very closely, as you know, with a number of universities uh, for recruitment, um, especially in this difficult time when all districts uh, nationwide are having uh, difficulty hiring uh, for a variety of vacancies. So this memorandum of understanding is with Alliant um, to continue our collaboration so that they can provide our su support and supervision of interns, which is uh, which do qualify for under um, NCLB and under ESE, um, the ESSA Now Every Student Succeeds Act, which replaced it as a highly qualified. And this agreement is with Alliant, as, and it's similar to other agreements with a number of post-secondary institutions, including CSU and UC, where we get the vast majority of our teachers. Okay. And any comments or questions? Okay. So I'm glad to... I actually have a quick question. Go ahead. So again, I'm just, like, Alliant University doesn't seem like a super tip-top place. I Googled it and I read all about it. And is there a reason why we're not partnering with other schools that are more highly ranked? We do. We have CSU, um, a number of the universities in that system, UC. So what we want to do is expand it to as many universities as I possible. See. Okay, so all right. And, and expand our um, recruitment pool. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if there's no more questions or comments, if someone would like to make a motion. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, no opposed. Um, item passes 403. Thank you. And now we're at 9.4. This is a revised class description for the supervisor of transportation and Dr. Colleen. Um, this position was created to accommodate a request from our CSEA um, leadership to make sure that we had managerial oversight as well as the safety needs for our employees in transportation in the PM shift um, in order to provide administrative coverage and supervision for the hours that transportation department operates. The district requests an additional supervisor um, to cover this PM time. The cost of the position will be covered through internal efficiencies that will lead to cost savings, and the current class description has been revised to address the needs of the department, and the, the class description is at, uh, uh, attached. The current pay range for this classification will remain the same, range 30, um, 76000 to 90000 uh, 90, a year. And any speakers to this item? None. Okay. And board comments, questions? Okay. I'll make um, a motion, unless you want to say I something. Have, yeah, oh, I have, yeah. I'm just, sorry. I just had a question. Okay. Um, would you speak about the, um, the pay rate again? Is this the same pay rate that you're? Yes. It's just a revision, so it reflects the actual duties. 
that the, are being the, the big revision is that the hours where this person is going to be working. Okay. Because um, we have uh, transportation employees that work at various times of the day, um, field trips in the afternoon and, and certain evening activities. So we, want some, we wanted a manager to be there present mm -hmm. uh, for the safety needs as well as oversight for okay. the employees. That makes sense. Um, okay, thank you. So um, who made the motion? Okay. And is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And none opposed, so the motion passes 403. Thank you. And um, 9.5 is a new class description, an avid tutor. So I'm really interested to hear about this. This one is near and dear to my heart, um, and especially um, AVID is something that I've been involved with in my own personal career. And um, what the, the program is, it's a called Advancement via Individual Determination, and it goes, um, it works very closely to help us um, with a college and career uh, vision that our superintendent you know, um, wants to make sure we have for our students. And um, it's an educational system whose mission is to close achievement gaps by preparing students for college ready readiness and success in a global society. And AVID tutors are going to be coming from the colleges and they differ from the standard um, tutors in a collaborative study group. And an AVID elective class tutor uses a 10-step AVID tutorial process um, to help the students prepare for college and as well as prepare them for, um, help them develop college readiness skills. Um, and this tutor will be responsible for working with the teacher and assisting the teacher in grouping students and tutoring groups uh, with a ratio of seven to one. And um, this ratio is the AVID system expectation. And instead of teaching a tutorial session, the AVID tutor facilitates the inquiry process among the group members rather than interacting one-on-one -on -one with a student presenter. And our district will have three schools that are implementing AVID um, for the system, Watsonville High, EA Hall, and Watsonville Charter School of the I Arts, and they will be following a clearly defined our AVID tutor job description, and which is needed to make sure that the, the tutors that we have are fulfilling the, the tutorial responsibilities to our students. There are no speakers, so um, any questions or comments from the board? I was just going to make a motion to approve. Okay, I have a oh, okay, go ahead. Um, how, how, how many tutors did you say four? Uh, it, it will depend on the schools, um, but the, they're going to be paid, their college tutors will be paid at a rate of $12 an hour. And so each site gets to decide whether they're going to hire one? Yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's going to be multiple tutors. Okay. Um, because you have a ratio of seven to one. Mm -hmm. So and depending on how many AVID students we have, we need to make sure that we have enough uh, tutors to serve right. that. Okay. I'm groups. really glad that we're doing this because this is just another piece, layer of that foundation to get the college readiness going. So, so happy to see this. Okay. So... Kim, if you wanted to make the motion. Uh, make a motion to approve the AVID tutors. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Jeff? Yeah, aye, okay. <laughs> all right, motion passes 403, thank you. Item 9.6 is a new class description for Director of Human Resources Administrative Services. And this is my last of the action oh, items. Oh, we're going to miss you. <laughs> um, thank you, um, President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this position, um, we um, have support from CSEA, as they indicated during their comments, and also we, we shared it with PVFT. And the position was created because of uh, a number of things that have come up. Um, we had the Janus decision um, made by the U.S. Supreme Court as well as state laws AB 119 and AB 86 um, that impact um, PBFT um, membership. And this position was created because we anticipate a number of information requests, but we also um, will need to do that so that we can 
uh, adhere to and comply with the work with the consent and um, meet and consent part of working with our unions. And um, in addition, um, CSEA leadership had expressed a need to restructure our investigation protocols um, so that we can include um, an assistant to the Title IX complaints officer, which is me, uh, so that we can ensure that we have a comprehensive and objective um, investigation process to make um, you know, appropriate recommendations to the Personnel Commission as well as to the, our Governing Board of Trustees. Okay, thank you. And I don't see any speakers, um, questions, comments from the board. So this is a new new position or? Um, yes. Okay. And is this a typical position that school districts? There are a number of school districts that do that. And I think the important piece to this system is that we needed a liaison that bridges HR with business. Mm -hmm. um, and the information systems, um, these are very um, unique skills um, that require technology and we work with DS and um, you, these are very you know, specialized skills. And it's important that we get a good person in the position um, because um, we're going to, we, we will see an uptick in demand of um, information requests from various groups, especially in light of the Janus decision. And we want to continue to be transparent with our um, CSEA and PVFT. Um, we're, we've worked very hard building that collaboration. And so when they need information, we want to make sure that we provide it for them so they can make informed decisions for their membership. Okay, I'm glad that this, um, we're recommending that we're putting that support in there for that reason, because I think that we've come a long way with our uh, uh, relationship building with our, um, I am on, good, um, <laughs> with our employee groups. So um, if this person's going to be able to help support and facilitate that going forward, that, that's great news. So um, if there's no other questions or comments, somebody would like to make a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nope. Item passes 403. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Um, item 9.7 is um, adoption of a resolution and award of contract for new student information system. And this is not by Dr. Colleen. This is by Richard, Richard Arellano, Director of Purchasing. Thank you. I don't think your mic is on, and you do have to speak kind of close to it. Sorry. A lot, a, a lot of times it doesn't work. It's yeah, it's plugged in. Yeah, we're getting another battery. Yes. You know, this is just because the board meeting has gone pretty quickly, right? Yeah. So we have to like slow it down a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so much. Close it before the batteries fall out. All right, there we go. All right, try that again. Okay, you should probably hold it. Hold it. Yeah, there you go. Great, okay. Um, Good evening, President DeRose, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm Rich Ariano, the Director of Purchasing, and I'll be presenting our um, new SIS system with our Director of, Director of Technology, Dan Weiser. Um, and Dan is gonna start with an intro on what, our, what an SIS system is. Perfect, thank you, yeah. Um, so 
Uh, I'm just going to do a brief description. Most of you probably have some understanding of what a student information system is. Um, it is sort of the central database used by the district. It's touched by nearly every employee. It houses all of our student data related to attendance and grades and transcripts, demographics and medical information and really every key piece of information that, um, that we need to maintain and then also report on for all sorts of state reporting requirements and others. And that central database then feeds into dozens of other databases. So it's really our critical core database. Um, and it's really, you know, it's pretty much used, accessed, or at least reported through for to every staff member in the district one way or another. Um, and now, back off, back to me. Um, I'm going to share a little bit on the, uh, the process of uh, our, um, our request for proposals and RFP process. We issued a request for um, the purchase, installation, hosting, and maintenance of, uh, of a new system. Um, we received two proposals. Those came from uh, EduPoint, Synergy, and Illuminate. Uh, to evaluate and score those proposals, we com you know, compiled a, uh, a stakeholder group consisting of teachers, school and district administrators, registrars, counselors, health clerks, technical staff, and office managers. And they reviewed two um, extensive proposals that I mean, contained over 800 questions. And um, some of the other scoring categories were references, implementation, functionality, integration. Um, and they went through all of that and uh, evaluated those collaboratively. And then we would meet as scoring groups to um, discuss. Uh, some stakeholders visited and spoke with school districts using the two systems. Um, again, the review and scoring of those two systems was extensive. And at the end of the scoring process, a vast majority of the stakeholders selected uh, Synergy by EduPoint as the, uh, the system that they wanted to proceed with. Yes, I can speak louder, sorry. I'll speak louder. <laughs> Um, I'm going to touch on a few of the uh, enhanced features, specifically uh, with Synergy, the, the system that was selected. Um, and these are just a few of the, the, the features that were kind of detailed and, and appreciated by the stakeholders. Um, the, it has a teacher portal with a really comprehensive grade book that uh, al al you know, allows for all sorts of data analysis and uh, easy access for teachers. And then a parent and student portal so that they can easily follow along with their, you know, their grades and the, and the system itself uh, and increase that whole home student connection, communication. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, you know, an reporting tools and analysis tools built in um, along with all kinds of data uh, validation and rules engines, things that make sure that the data is input correctly, and that it's not, um, you know, the, that, that all of the requirements are met as people are, uh, are, are using the system. And then that, that data is preserved in a way that you know we don't have any loss or, or issues. Um, and they also have the highest level of security in terms of FERPA and HIPAA uh, and data um, retention. So those are some of those features. I'm handing it back to you. Thank you. And the last bit of information we have is the, uh, the pricing for the first three years of the system. Um, so the year one cost of $258,951 includes the uh, software licensing for the program, um, hybrid hosting, EduPoint will be hosting the, um, all the information with, with them, um, premium annual services, which includes uh, annual training for, for district staff, um, and then the installation training, uh, installation training of our district staff and deployment. Um, by the end of the first year, everybody that's going to be using it will be a uh, have been trained on it with uh, the rollout for this next fall. So uh, fall of 2019, there should be a live system. And then um, second year cost includes a lot of the same stuff uh, without the install and training. Uh, by the time we get to year three, that'll be just the software license maintenance and um, annual training. The note at the bottom, uh, currently what we're paying for our, um, our current student information system is about $110,000 annually. Yep. Just maintenance. Questions? Okay. No stickers, I guess. No stickers. 
Uh huh. Who wants to go first? I know there's questions. I do. Okay, go ahead, Maria. So, would there be any ongoing maintenance costs after the year three? Yeah. And what there, would that look like? Yeah, there there are ongoing maintenance costs. Um, I mean, with every system, with every technical system, especially a hosted system like this, mm -hmm. we will pay for ongoing maintenance. Um, there's always a need for customization or issues come up, data problems, and then we get, you know, we open support tickets and they make sure they address those. And this is too critical a system to not maintain a maintenance contract with the, the vendor itself themselves. I don't know if you have the ac actual cost of just maintenance going forward. Yeah. Um, so from year three, uh, go back one, the, uh, the built-in escalation for these charges. So from the 140,537, it escalates two and a half percent each year. So for year four, um, it would go up to $144,000. And then two and a half percent the year after that. And ongoing as long as we have this system in use. <laughs> what are we paying now? So. What right we, now we're what paying. What do we have now? And so what we have we, now? we have eSchool Plus. Uh, it's a system we've had about ten years. Our initial implementation, the first year for that system, was about three hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. That company was purchased by PowerSchool, and they're going to phase this product out. Um, the support for it is already sort of falling away, and they're providing some support, but it's not not at the level it used to be, and um, we're having a hard time with that. Um, and there are issues in the system and they're no longer developing it. So we really need to move to a new system. Uh, so per year right now, we're paying 110000 for our current system, for support from our current system. So that will go away when we transition to this system, right? We won't, be, we won't need to pay them. Well, there will be one year where we'll be, because we'll have this year of transition where we're still using eSchool Plus. So we'll pay for this year and we'll pay for one year of the new system. But then after that, we won't be paying for eSchool Plus anymore. Once the three years is up, we'll still be paying 110 or whatever right. it is just for the technical support. Yeah. It, you know, it's more than technical support. It's, it's hosting, right? They host all the servers, manage all the servers. Um, they do backups of all the data. They do a whole bunch of other features beyond just help tickets. But yeah, we will be paying ongoing to have their support. And every system, every student information system, there will be an ongoing maintenance cost. Mm -hmm. What it sounds like to me, and I don't mean to take this, this response here, what we have now is going obsolete. Yes. Okay. Is there anything else? I do. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. No, no. I'm the person I can. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I've heard that there's some people that don't really like eSchools Plus and have never liked it in this district. Is that correct? Well, th yes, okay. that is correct. So <laughs> you said you mentioned. I've heard that. Okay. You mentioned um, <laughs> stakeholders. Who um, was invited in on the selection? So we had um, really, we selected from every single group, especially people that work directly with the system on a daily basis. So that was, you know, nurses to look at the health modules. Mm -hmm. We had registrars, people that did scheduling to look at all the scheduling features, people that did, that do all of the, that use all the reports and state reporting. And, and really, uh, we brought in people that were sort of experts from the district mm -hmm. to evaluate those components and look at the differences between the products. Um, and we made sure that we had them all there and that they reviewed them and that, you know, we, they scored them. Uh, and there was, you know, an overwhelming majority preferred this product. Okay. So you just said scheduling. Does that mean scheduling of classes? Classes, rostering, yeah. So w will that integrate with transportation? Yeah. So this will be the central database. We oh, will have to so build those integrations to oh, every okay. other system. Yeah. I, oh, I, okay. Oh, that's yeah. good. There will be a lot of work. Okay. <laughs> and... Um, you know, the fear everybody should have today is cybersecurity. Right. So what's, can you explain to me what, um, just very basically, yeah. are you? Right. Well, you know, that, that is everyone's fear, and especially when we're dealing with confidential information. Um, and this organization has the highest level of security procedures in place. Mm -hmm. And they comply with all the different um, laws, and especially related to HIPAA, FERPA, and you know, retaining confidential information and preventing, you know, attempting in every way possible to prevent mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, uh, an attack or a, a, an actual breach of their security. But okay. Right. 
went off by itself again. <laughs> anyway, will this allow us to continue? Because that is that's important data, so we can track students after they leave high school to see where they're going to college, are they completing, are they going into the workforce, are they earning a living wage? Yes. Because uh, a lot of our grant funding is based on those outcomes. Right. So that's important to keep those. Yeah, and th th that was one of the um, really kind of positives of this system is it's really highly configurable in, in ways that eSchool Plus has not been. Um, in a lot of cases, we've had to pay them to customize certain aspects of eSchool Plus, whereas this system is designed to be customized by us in whatever way, you know, ways that we need to meet our needs and meet our procedures and, and we will be able to continue to do that. Yes. Good, good. Um, and then um, you mentioned home school communication. Is this the system where a parent can log in and look at their students' homework assignments and grades so they can keep track? Yes. Because I would like to do that. Yes. Well, we, s <laughs> we currently we currently I get have the no homework <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah, there's a por there's a parent portal that's designed for all of that, um, mm -hmm. and 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 students also to be able to log in and check and verify that mm -hmm. you know things are showing up correctly and follow up on missing assignments and things like that. Awesome. Sorry, I have a lot of questions. That's all right. Um, oh, I think that might have been it. I think I got them all. Okay, good. Well, thank you. I'm glad, and I'm hoping this is going to make the sites happy and. Um, it'll make it more user friendly. So this looks great. Is any there other comments? Yeah, one more thing. Is there any grant funding that's out there that could help us with this implementation or purchase or anything? Not that we are aware of. Um, I, you know, we're always looking for opportunities. No, I haven't seen an E rate come before us in a long right. time. Right. Well, no, we get on? we have E rate uh, okay. funds. Um, um, we will be bringing some E rate projects to the board, um, and you know, E rate regulations have changed to some extent, and so there's been some some differences, but. Uh, but this is doesn't qualify for E-rate. There were there was a time E-rate part of the E-rate regulations have changed and certain things are no longer um, E-rate eligible. And it, it used to be that stu student communication software was, and so there were times where we used E-rate to fund some right. of those types of software, but no longer. Okay. So I'd like to second that motion. Okay, great. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, there's none opposed, so a motion passes 403. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're um, on item 9.8, the approve the Youth Truth proposal, mm -hmm. and this is uh, presented by Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, so thank you very much. So one thing that I truly believe in, the directors that are out there um, know this because I say it frequently to them and to cabinet is, the only way that we can make good decisions is when we ha make informed decisions. And so one thing that we do, and we started um, almost two years ago now when I got here, was to be in the schools frequently so and be at community events so that we can get firsthand communication. However, um, we still miss a lot of people, right? We still miss the ability to get feedback from a large portion of te from people. Um, and so because of that, we really want to have an ongoing survey that year in and year out, we can establish baseline data and then make growth in those areas. So we're very goal-driven, data-driven. Um, what this will allow us to do is to have three separate surveys um, for one for staff, a one for students, um, grades three through 12. Um, I'm sorry, four through 12, excuse me, four through 12, and then um, also um, parents in both English and Spanish. And it really, what I appreciate about this survey is it is customizable, which we're customizing it to, um, for instance, include our anti-bullying campaign, which we're going to be rolling out. But it also really targets the six theme area, core areas really focus on our LCAP goals and the board goals. So when you look at what they are, school culture, right? So we're doing a huge focus on PBIS, engagement and empowerment, right? Do people feel empowered to um, by our actions, relationships? Um, communication and feedback, so how are, well are we or are not doing um, on communication, school safety, and also people's um, perception of the resources in which they have. Is it sufficient resources? If not, where are those resources lacking? And so um, I'm asking the board support on this. I do feel um, they've worked with many, many school districts throughout the nation and seen um, 
great growth. What we know is what we pay attention to, we improve on. So if we can identify at each level of our organization where we can improve, where we have the lowest results, and then do concrete steps to improve that, um, I believe it will benefit our district. So any questions you have? Any questions from the board? Um, I actually love this, um, I don't know what you call it, initiative, project. Initiative. Yeah. I, I think hearing from students and hearing their voice um, is, is good. And I think that um, giving them the opportunity to be surveyed in a way that their name might not need to be yeah. used, it's anonymous, I think is, it is. is always good. I feel like since I have a um, high school daughter, I sometimes bring forward issues and problems as, as her friends and cohorts see them. But I think hearing directly from them in this way is, um, will be productive for our district to make some real change in areas that, um, that need it. So thank you. Anyone else? No? I was just reading over the questions, and um, I really like the questions. And I think, um, I, I think it'll tell us a lot. So good. I'm very happy to support this. Um, is there a motion to approve? Well approval. Okay, who wants to second out of the two of you? Okay. <laughs> so motion Staring by Maria, second by Jeff. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And none opposed, so item but passes four zero three. Item nine point nine is the food and nutrition services meal price increase. I remember as when my kids were in school um, as a parent, single parent, that always hurt when they went up, but I was happy to see that we haven't had to raise them in, not, what, nine years? So um, welcome. And I know our costs have gone up, so. Right. Um, yes. Um, it's, it's actually not on. Good evening. <laughs> uh, my name is Linda Liu. I'm the Director of Food and Nutri Nutrition Services. Um, and I'm bringing uh, tonight uh, the request for um, the meal prices uh, increase for the 2018-2019 school year. Um, the, back, um, the background information was provided as an attachment. Um, I'm looking to uh, propose each meal to go up by 25 cents, uh, breakfast and lunch for both elementary and then charter and secondary schools. Um, like you said, uh, meal prices have stayed steady at our district for the last almost 10 years. Um, I spoke to the former director, and she remembers that the last time prices were increased was in her very first year, and she was here seven years, and then it's been three years since she left. Um, so again, meal prices must cover um, not just the cost of food, but the supplies that hold the food, the containers, um, the labor and the benefits of the staff that prepare it. Um, so um, these are not um, uh, arbitrary numbers that we came up with. Uh, there is a um, paid lunch equity ruling um, that we follow from USDA, which oversees our program, and the state um, CDE nutrition services are the ones that audit our, uh, audit our program every three years. So there is a formula. You plug in your current meal prices, the number of meals that you serve at all the different tiers. Um, it comes out with a calculated number, and if you meet or you need to meet or exceed their set number of you know, minimum pricing every year. So three years ago, we went through our state audit. Um, at that time, we just skated through exactly on point. Um, so the past few years, we've been um, undercharging, um, not being under audit those years, and also um, we've changed to have provision uh, schools, so completely free schools. Um, previously, we had 18. Um, I just thought it, it, even though they had nothing to do with each other, I didn't want it to look like we were upcharging certain schools and then making certain schools free, even though it had nothing to do with each other. Um, so at that time, uh, without it being, you know, scrutinized under an audit, um, and that we were doing, you know, okay fiscally as a department, um, I let that slide for a couple years and. Um, we're coming up on an audit year, and we are um, under the formula, under the pricing now. 
So um, the comparison with the local districts, if we raise the 25 cents across the board, we will now equal the lowest price of um, the local districts. So even with, even with our increase for next year, we will now only match the lowest um, nearby pricing. So I looked at Santa Cruz City Schools, um, Live Oak, uh, Soquel Union, um, Aromas, uh, and North Monterey. Um, looking at the burden of cost per year additional, it's about if a parent sends them for lunch every single day of the school year, it's a $45 increase for the year per child. Great. Okay. Any comments from the board? Jeff? Is this enough to cover your cost? Is this enough of a, a raise to cover your cost? Um, we, you know, overall are doing, um, we're doing okay and covering our costs currently. Um, one of the reasons they create this paid lunch equity, sorry, uh, paid lunch equity, this ruling is that the funding they give you is on the the families that qualify for the free and reduced meals, mm -hmm. right? So as, t as taxpayers, we're agreeing that some of them, you know, there's funding that goes into these USD programs to feed public school students running these programs. So at this point, you know, we as citizens have not decided to cover all students, you know, in all schools, um, but we're gonna cover the ones that qualify for the program. So part of this ruling is that you must, at minimum, cover your costs for anyone that doesn't qualify so at this price, we would, um, I think we can meet the minimum with about a 15 cent increase. However, that will mean, you know, every year possibly coming back and doing another increase and just knowing that we haven't done it in 10 years, um, if we can go a few years without having to raise prices. Also, um, by increasing something by eight cents, it really doesn't make sense going through the line and trying to find, you know, giving change. So we try to find a good number um, looking at the other local districts, they also have round numbers as well. So 25 cents, um, I thought was going to equal the local, uh, the the nearest local uh, district price. It would be a round number that's easy to pay for um, in the line, and then it would hold us over for several years. You bring up a good point because I was going to say to you, we shouldn't be raising prices once every nine years. We should be going every year, raising it a little bit. And then the bite's not quite as, as harsh because that $45 is going to make a difference in somebody's life. Yeah. However, you're right. When you're in line and you have 30 kids waiting for you, that straight quarter will be. Yeah. It's really not common practice to make something $3.07. It's, it's, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So there really isn't a way to subsidize the cost. To can, we, can we be able as a district to cover that additional cost? Is the ratio, can you speak to the ratio to family subsidize? Or so I would say in terms of, yes, helping parents. So overall as a district, um, having our provision that we um, have approved, there's 24 schools going into the new year where uh, every student can eat at no cost. So that leaves you the remaining schools. Um, um, so I probably cover a few other programs. So we have four, so out of the ones that are remaining, um, I have as 11, um, four elementary, so Bradley, Mar Vista, Rio, Valencia, three charters, then Scott Wicks, uh, Pacific Coast, Junior high is Aptos Junior, high school is Aptos High, and then two post-secondaries under CELPA. So that's how I, we, because we feed all of them as sites, that's how I count them. Um, those are the only schools that would be affected because um, the other 24 schools are already covered at no cost. O on top of that, if the families fill out the meal application, if they qualify for either free um, or reduced price, so either qualification, we already cover the cost of the reduced price. So we don't charge any reduced qualifi qualified families either. So it's really only the families that either do not apply or do not meet any either of the, either of the qualifications to qualify for the reduced meal program. So the only ones would be possibly 11 schools, only the full paid students. Got it, okay, so that clarified 
thought about I was about to vote no on this one, but that that yeah. clarified yeah. the confusion. Okay, I um, I don't have any questions. So, uh, if anybody would like to make a motion. Do you have another question? I was going to regretfully make a motion. I wish we didn't have to raise scores, I mean, these prices at all. I think we should be subsidizing these. Um, but, I mean, I 25 cents, I know it does not seem like a lot, but I think for kids it is a lot. When they they have their own money, they're mostly working or babysitting or... Sure, the parents I mean, can't afford it. Of course, I yeah. um, sympathize, and that's why anything that we can qualify for, we apply for. Yeah. So um, I'd like to make a motion to approve this matter, but um, with the hope that potentially we could continue to look for. <laughs> well, I don't know. What is wrong with these mics? They keep going off. So after it's like a But I just a turned it on and was talking. <laughs> we'll, we'll deal with okay, that. yeah. We'll okay, so I'd like to um, make a motion to support the increases in school lunch costs with the hope that at some point we could try to find funding somewhere, whether it be grant funding or federal government funding to offset the the complete price of of the raises. So that was a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And hearing none opposed, that motion passes 403. And I just want to say thank you. I've appreciated the part of your your presentation where you talked about not raising it if we really didn't have to when we could have. Um, so that tells me that you really are looking out for our our families. So right. I mean, that's whenever we can, we apply for funding. And then, like I said, this is a required formula that the auditors will come looking for. Mm -hmm. And that's the part where they want to make sure that you're not using, f uh, you know, fund funded monies to offset something that's not funded. So that's mm -hmm. at the breaking point of where we have to do something. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> So this is item 9.11. Uh, 9.10, please. Where am I? Oh, 10. Sorry, I skipped 10. Um, and this is uh, an agreement with Code to the Future uh, for a five-year period, yep. July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2023. The Roaring Twenties are coming <laughs> again. Yeah. So Dr. Rodriguez. is to develop, there you go, is to develop um, computer science pathway at the middle and high school level through Project Lead the Way. What we haven't been doing yet, and, and we wish to do this next year, is um, have a school, an elementary school, become a computer science immersion school, which will allow every single student starting in kindergarten to have a computer science curriculum. And so Code to the Future has a computer science curriculum that they do starting in kinder all the way up to eighth grade. Um, and Valencia, so Karen Lane, um, has worked with her staff, and so members of her staff are are going to be um, the first members that are going have are willing to start the pilot and do this computer science um, pathway and so we're really excited because it not only um, will build the capacity there at um, at Valencia so that other teachers within our district can see it in action, but it also allows us to be part of the League of Innovative Schools. So the League of Innovative Schools is a very um, prestigious group of schools throughout the nation who are really dedicated to personalized learning and computer science for children. 
And so um, there's, of course, the computer science standards that are coming out, and this will allow us to, um, to put that in motion. So we did go visit um, schools in San Jose um, that are very similar to ours and are having excellent success rates. It was really inspirational to go see the students in action. Um, we sent um, both administration and teachers um, to see it, and we're glad that um, Valencia Elementary is willing to take it on, and we encourage you to um, support this um, initiative. Okay, any comments or questions from the board? No. Um, Friday before last, I attended the CSBA Leadership Institute in San Francisco, and it was all about computer science. And it was really amazing to me how few schools in California, high schools, even teach any computer science classes. And here we are, we've got Silicon Valley, the birth of the technology um, era, and there are more than half of the school high schools, I believe, in California don't even teach computer science. So there's a big movement out there, and I, I've heard up to three and a half million jobs are projected to go unfilled in those industries. Uh, so there's a lot of initiatives out there, and I'm so glad that we're doing this, and especially the innovative, what was it? League of Innovative, League of innovative Schools. Um, we should be there. We're right in the backyard of um, Silicon Valley, and and it's not just Silicon Valley, you know, it, as we know, you can be in high tech anywhere in the world now. So um, I think it's really going to give our students a great opportunity um, and expand um, those opportunities. Anyway, sorry, I just jumped right in there. Kim, go ahead. No, I was just going to say on behalf of Valencia Elementary, where I was the site council chair for many years and on the PTA, I think the parents um, and certainly the staff there are very, very excited to accept this really prestigious honor to have the computer science pathway there. Um, I would also like to say that, I, you know, it just seems like one, one initiative, one program after another, we're really building capacity and innovation in our district, and it's very exciting. So thank you for bringing this forward. Yeah. I think that's a great point that Kim made. We, we had our meeting last night, and we kept using the word innovation. And that's where, where we're really moving as a district. And I think you're the, you are the one who is taking that charge. So thank you very much. And the meeting that Jeff is talking about is the um, newly formed PV Education Foundation. We held our retreat last night, and we were talking mm -hmm. about innovation a lot with um, Maria as well. So, um, so this is an action item. And um, I would be honored to make a motion to support. <laughs> Um, to support this. Aptos or Ap, you want a second? I'll second. Okay. okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, hearing none opposed, motion passes 403. Awesome. I can't wait. So now we are at 9.11, and this is an approval um, motion, uh, approved resolution 1819.04 adopting justification study an increase of level one developer fees. I'm guessing this is by CBO Dominguez. Yes, uh, good evening, President DeRosa. So uh, before you this evening is our level one developer fee uh, study and justification um, and outline within the agenda item. It gives the, um, the proposed increase for residential at 31 cents and at commercial at uh, five cents. Um, and the justification study gives an outline of the areas that are covered in that. We, it's a very thorough analysis that's done throughout our district, and it covers from our enrollment projections and certification to census data, the use of current and previous developer fees, uh, an assessment of our development costs at our uh, sites, uh, and then we have an adjustment or index of the assessment of that development through the State Allocation Board uh, that made approval in January of this year uh, for districts throughout the state to increase uh, level one and level two, but specifically the level one on this agenda item. Um, and then here this evening with us is Ken Reynolds with School Works, who uh, is the consultant firm that assisted the district uh, in completing the analysis. So we're here to take any questions from the board.
Are there any questions? There are no speakers. We don't have speakers yet for any of the items. And um, so, one, uh, one thing I forgot to point out is I provided a sample list on the, um, the summary, um, how developer fees uh, have been used. Uh, an example is McQuitty. We had one new classroom, a MESD, an additional classroom, Aptos Junior, uh, an additional classroom, uh, transportation department is a portable for operations, and Lakeview Middle School was provided three uh, portable classrooms with developer fees. Uh, so continue um, assisting our facilities district-wide uh, in enhancing our, our um, and supporting our program needs uh, through uh, facilities. Thank you. Um, so this came to my attention because I had some constituents come to me last year as they were building a house, and not a large house, maybe like 1,800 square feet, but the... Um, the developer fees that they were being charged added like almost an extra ten thousand dollars or more to their project so I'm I'm confused about why on residential properties were they're being assessed pr the proposal is 3.79 but commercials only one or 0.61 that makes no sense to me it seems like it's flip-flopped it, it hurts a person who wants to build a house but commercial developers can just build at will with almost no penalty. Yeah, the, the key factors there are that you can homes on the <laughs> construction <laughs> items actually, you can hold them. actually yeah. build or generate the students. And so it is more, uh, more the, the homes have more of an impact than a business. In addition, businesses typically have a lot of square footage involved. And so even though it's a lower dollar, per square foot, their checks are actually typically larger than the check you would see for a typical home. And the other reason that the homes pay a larger fee uh, in your district is because they actually are subject to the level two fees, which we'll be talking about shortly. Uh, I didn't have a presentation. We, we just had the study. I can talk to some of the items. Mostly what you're seeing here, again, is just an adjustment for inflation. And that's why the state does the adjustment every two years, um, is to keep up with inflation and the increasing costs of building school projects. So we have a project going in in um, the Aptos community um, on uh, Trail Gulch Road, which I think 72 units of, so some are apartments. So is this fee also being um, levied on, on on building like that where it's like apartments and condos and townhouses? Yes, all, all residential type projects. Mm -hmm. The only exception is senior housing projects. They only pay the commercial fee because again, they don't generate students directly. It's just the jobs they create that can have an impact on en enrollment in schools. Thank you. Um, when will these new fees go into effect? The, the level one study fees don't go into effect for 60 days after approval, and so... Approval here? Yes. Okay. And we have some housing developments in Watsonville that are on the books, and I think are going to be over 300 units, so... Right. However, the level two study, uh, those, as I said, it's a different set of government code that applies to the level one versus level two. When we get to talk about the level two, they do go into effect immediately. And that does impact the residential units. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Joe, th I'm sorry, Mr. Dominguez. When, um, when, when we um, take in this money for the building that occurs, is it set aside in a special fund and used for facilities? Or yeah. does it go directly just into the general fund? No, it's set aside and it's set up for facilities. Okay. Um, and then as we move forward, we look at enrollment projections and then the impact to our school sites due to enrollment or ins expansion of programs. And um, as stated in the description, then we can use it for uh, enhanced playgrounds, multi-purpose rooms, cafeteria, classrooms, um, gym space. So it's really a benefit for the district to contribute back into our, our school facilities. Asked, I don't 
I don't remember ever seeing that type of money being used for any of those projects in the past. So well, one of the things that moving forward, this should be an annual report. So we're working oh. with Ken, I believe in December, we're going to come back and provide a report how developer fees have been used. That's great. And, uh, and actually just to show the benefit of those funds <laughs> and the impact that it has uh, throughout our district. Thank you. We look forward to that. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, so if somebody would like to make a motion. Also move. Okay. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And hearing no um, opposition, passes 403. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item. 9.12 approved contract for bond program management and this is Mr. Dominguez as well. All right for this item we have um, our bond program and um, there was an RFP RFQ uh, process developed by our purchasing and procurement division. Uh, in that process uh, we had an interview and screening process uh, included our CBOC chair uh, facilities department, myself, and other uh, interview panel um, provided that thorough process. Um, and through that, uh, coming corporation was selected. Um, the firm will assist the district in various methods within our, our program management of our bond program. Uh, one of the major components that they'll assist the district in is developing a master schedule of all our projects and a timeline. Uh, coupled with cost estimating um, process to making sure that our projects are in alignment with their budget and their scope uh, and making sure that it's a transparent process as well um, so that we can also make sure that we have um, projects that are designed within budget and also meet expectations of our school sites and uh, district leadership um, and they'll also assist um, which they're uh, with budget delivery methods. So for example, uh, Pavarello High um, is looking at some delivery methods and working with our architectural firms and our legal firm to making sure that we, uh, in negotiations with various contractors, making sure that the schedule is tight and there is not a built-in cushion and that we get projects in an built in an efficient manner, um, both time and cost. Um, and then the other key piece that I really stressed in the, um, the scope was making sure to enhance our um, fiscal bond transparency. So community engagement meetings with our citizens bond oversight committee and our school site leadership. And we're developing uh, communication pieces with our public information officer uh, to getting the updates through the school sites and to parents and the overall community. So all that in one. Um, this firm will assist us in the overall program management of the bond program. And we have a uh, representative here this evening, uh, Frank uh, from Cumming Corporation, if we have any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, no speakers. No, no speakers. Um, any questions from the board? So is this, um, is this new? Have we had um, a management company before, didn't we? Used to do all these things in house. So we had uh, internally uh, the program management component was internal, but the construction management was contracted out. Um, the okay. need, uh, just on our analysis, is more assistance on the program management, the overall general oversight of our bond program, mm -hmm. and then keeping the construction management. And I guess the easiest way to explain it is big picture. Uh, short-term and long-term planning is where we need assistance as a district. The day-to-day -day in the construction trailer uh, is where we have some internal capacity to do that. I think, um, and Frank, we could talk about other um, districts, what we've done with bond oversight committees throughout other districts. That would be great. But they, they assist in 
um, the various budget reports and the, the scopes, et cetera, and providing more transparency, and I'll, I'll mm -hmm. let Frank answer that. Is this on? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what a, a large part of what we will be doing is looking at the not only just the bond funding, but all the different funding um, that the district has for all the projects you know, based on the master plan and try to help um, show wh what monies can be or would be used from the bond and what from, from other uh, funding sources so that it would be, we would put uh, spreadsheets together, systems together so that it would, everybody could see exactly where the monies were coming from, where we would be overseeing the, uh, the total cost uh, budgeting um, and, and as Joe said, the scheduling for, for long term for all the different projects. With the Prop 51 funding that we should be getting as well? Yes, so that'll be also an area that uh, the firm will assist us on is looking at the multiple uh, buckets of funding, uh, how to realign those buckets of funding and prioritize overall projects. Uh, one of the other components that kind of getting into the weeds, but it's very difficult and we need assistance, is working on our uh, district standards and specs is, um, for example, this room, what is the size of the room for a, like a classroom? And what does the instructional wall look like? How many outlets? Is it carpet, tile? All those, and the IT component, um, all those details are taken into our standards and specs. And that's something we as a district need to work on and enhancing. Uh, so that's also something that we'll work on as a team. Yeah, working with the different departments uh, will be a, a major uh, thing that we would need to, to help with. That's great. Kim. So Dr. Rodriguez, this is a gigantic amount of money that that is going to one contractor. So I really need to hear why we need this, because this is money that could actually be put into a facility to really do some improvements, like at Aptos High or Aptos Junior High, where we really need improvements to happen. I think one of the first marching orders the team's going to have is uh, if approved this evening, we will, they will join the negotiations team with the contractor that has been, is proposed for the football field um, project at Pavarela High School. The cost saving measures that the firm can bring regarding timeline, scope, et cetera, that's just one project, but we believe there's probably a minimum $500,000 savings that the firm can assist us in saving. Um, that's just one project. There's going to be multiple projects that that similar scope or um, expertise will be used on, so additional savings. Um, and I think one of the things that we're doing, and we can, they're going to assist me in looking into this, is not having our district's uh, standards and specs. We are building facilities or modernizing facilities, um, and I'll use Dan and IT as an example, is we'll build or modernize a school site but for one reason or another, the specs within IT weren't included and or we missed it by, um, by a portion. So then we got to come back around and spend additional money to fix it or to install it the right way or provide it. Um, and that's an additional cost to the district. And so if we can just correct that and get that on the front end, that'll be an additional savings. Um, and then the overall, um, program management of the bond program and assisting the district in aligning and prioritizing the various buckets of funding um, will also be a cost savings measure. Spent the majority of our bond money, so I don't know what money you're talking about except the next issuance. We have, the issuance has already been provided. Okay, um, so our other, our third issuance has now come in? Yeah, that has been done okay. prior, yes. So that's it, that's all the money we have left. Correct. Right? Now it's, prioritizing those bond dollars, maximize as much as we can, Prop 51, Prop 39 energy efficiency dollars, our developer fees, uh, deferred maintenance funding, all those funding sources to make sure there is, when they complement each other and E-rate, uh, where does E-rate cover like 80 cents on the dollar? We need to make sure that we align projects and funding to for the additional 20 cents on the dollar and making sure that flows throughout it is a very cumbersome process uh, for all the various buckets of funding, and that's something that we need to work on as a district to be more efficient. If, if I could add something, um, 
some of our team members, we have a number of different uh, expertise uh, people in it. Uh, we, we do a lot of constructability reviews so that we will look at drawings that um, that you, know, you normally would look at and, and you go p take it out to bid and perhaps there's some things on it that are not clear and then you end up doing change orders to, uh, to, d to do the, ch the things that were not on the, on the drawings. We have sust sustainability managers who will look at uh, drawings and such just, just from that viewpoint to see if there's anything that, that might have been missed. Uh, we do a lot, uh, our cost analysis uh, team is very adept at value engineering as well. Is this a three-year contract? Yes. Yeah. And one of the strategies behind that is, one, is to enhance our current position um, within our bond program. Um, you know, I'm expecting probably a year. Um, well, we're going to hit the ground running uh, here very quickly, but a year to really show the community, you know, your bond dollars at work. There's some great projects out there that we've already completed. But now you have the multiple sources of funding that we really need to show how we're maximizing that. And I think we need um, to really answer the question, if we were to do this internal, it would be additional. Uh, one is we don't have the internal capacity to provide that, the resources that um, they'll bring. Um, so we don't have the, the time component. Um, but overall, it, it positions the district for a later capital program uh, bond program in the future and that's one of the pieces that it will assist us with is making sure uh, to line us up for a true facilities master plan so short-term but also long-term planning I understand this is important but that's a lot of money that we could be putting we, we, we walked uh, Michelle and I spent some time in school today, and there's there's a need. Um, what I would what I would say to to it is I, I recognize that it's two million dollars worth of the Major L money, so I, I recognize that. But very similar to what we saw with the manager of risk and safety is by investing money in, we can get money out. And you, you will see just even tonight, but every single board meeting we do change orders. Um, and we have to get ourselves to where we're ahead of the game. And for me, the most important, one of the most important pieces is the, ma is the facilities master plan. Because if we don't get ourselves very much just like we did a three-year plan for academics, right? If we don't have a 10, 20-year master plan for our facilities, we're never going to get ourselves to where we're using the money in the most important places and at the most important time. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I recognize that it's a lot of money, but we, we do need to figure out how we can get ourselves to the point where we, we triage as quickly and efficiently as possible. And right now, we are not doing that. Um, we are sometimes doing something and then recognizing that if we would have done step B before step A, um, we would have been much more efficient. And so we're, we're, re, you know, we're, we're using money um, not as efficiently as we should. Um, and just like with the PVHS project, with one project, we feel like we're going to get almost a fourth of that money back, right, um, within just one project. So I, I, we understand your, your points. I just want you to also understand our, our thoughts on why we brought it forward. You have more questions? Do you want to wait a second or do you want to go? Okay. So this is a huge amount of money and, and uh, with the fact that we had $300 million worth of work that we needed and, but we couldn't go out for that amount um, in our bond, there was a lot left behind. So I feel like this um, is going to be, it's going to reduce the number of projects that we can get completed. I'm not a, a no, but I, I'm hearing hes hesitation from the board. Um, and one of the things actually that's standing out for me about this presentation is usually when we're presented with a large contract, 
um, we get more of um, a presentation about the contractor. What, what's the background? What are the projects they've done? What's the money they've saved people? Uh, we don't, I don't, is, is that in, I don't think that's in here, right? So um, what would happen if we brought it back with a more robust presentation on the contractor? Um, yeah, Michelle, did you have? Is there? No, the, that's fine. I mean, that we can come back and provide a more in-depth uh, presentation so you, uh, you can get an, an overview of the firm's uh, background and expertise. And I think you'll, there's uh, throughout the state of California, and, and Frank uh, can speak on that, but uh, the team will be very pleased, and I think the, the board will be very uh, impressed. And that's nothing against you. That's just we typically I get. I understand. It's like, wow, these, you know, mm -hmm. really great presentations. And for a, a contractor over $2 million, I'm, I'm not comfortable awarding something to somebody we've never met and we don't have background on. Understand. So I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but I would suggest that we pull it if. So then, do we make a do we make a move to pull it? I'm not sure. Do we need to make a motion to pull it? Yeah. Because it would be an adjustment to the agenda, correct? Yeah, so you move that before we pull it out. Then we'll make sure. A motion. Joe, I thought we couldn't spend Measure L dollars on this type of. Um, yes. Yeah, so for no personnel, no. So for for oversight of the bond program, we can. So we have some staff, even internal district staff, that are funded by the bond program. So for management oversight, we can. Okay. And just a quick question, going back to the master plan, <coughs> does that also include a plan for years down the road with increases to student population, number of students that we're going to be serving, the fact that we may need to um, construct new schools or build on what we currently have correct so it'll and give compass all of that right and so that'll they'll assist with the analysis of um, our condition of our facilities so not only just the age but the condition and replacement cost um, and a very detailed but I'll I will probably have that presentation from the um, coming corporation but they'll assess every property um, assist the district in that and do a cost analysis. Um, um, I know one of the items that they'll work on is looking at what does it take for uh, enhanced athletic fields or a cafeteria or a multi-purpose room. Well, they're very thorough on cost estimating, so they'll provide an, a front-up cost estimation of what that would take for the district. So all those scenarios will be taken into consideration. Yes. So what, uh, what kind of, we, we've been talking a lot about negotiations tonight, right? Yes. What kind of negotiations did we do to, to get to this number? Do you, uh, is it like walking into a store and that is the number they give you and you're stuck with it? Or <laughs> did we do our best to <laughs> bring the number into what yes, the board so considers reasonable? Yes, we, we did have a very intense negotiation process and uh, they were one of the firms that actually dropped their, um, through the negotiation process, the rates were reduced, and the amount is up to, not to exceed. Um, so that's another piece of the language or negotiations that we also included, so I appreciate that question. Um, and other firms were a flat fee um, with not as much negotiation um, on the back end number, but there was some flexibility in this one. did that um, can can we pull this and then have them come back with a more more thorough investigation I'd like to really and to be very frank with you I'd like to review these things before 1030 at night is that so I'm looking for yeah is that a motion it's a motion okay I have another thing to say do I need to second it first second it okay a second um, the other thing I, I think I would like to recognize is that we've got an M and O staff that is working so hard to complete these projects and they've done so with with a skeleton crew very little help etc so like it, it's not that I don't recognize that we need to bring assistance to that department they've done a great job and they and 
I think need need some assistance. It's too much work for the very few amount few um, right, Victor, for the few people that you guys have there. It's just too much to manage, and some people are detailed people, and some people are big picture people, and so. I get that this firm is like the big picture and the details kind of all wrapped in. It sounds like you've got a bunch of people with you that with expertise. So I recognize the need for it. I just, I do feel like we need a, a greater um, presentation about what it's going to mean and why we need it and who they are and what expertise. Is it, is it an architectural firm? Like I have no clue who these people are. So, okay. so we'll bring that uh, back and then we'll have a thorough presentation and give a uh, a breakdown of the services provided by uh, Cumming Corporation, and then also provide, um, uh, we can go through the list of districts in California, but we'll give some um, the references and um, presentations of other districts. There are a number of different districts that we're working with right now, either in the Bay Area, or Los mm -hmm. Angeles, okay. you know, pretty much all over. And our, this particular team that would be working here are, uh, two of us at least, do live in the district. Okay. Have, that's have good. Either no. kids in the district, or I, mm -hmm. I have a grandchild that's mm -hmm. <laughs> going to be starting kindergarten in the year after next. And Great. Uh, so. Yeah, we just you know <laughs> are we're stewards yeah. of the taxpayer dollars, so and, and, and we I'm one at, of and you are one of them. So so understand. you should appreciate, appreciate that we are that. tabling this for right now. <laughs> okay. uh, so President DeRose, I make a motion to extend the meeting. Oh, okay. Well, let's vote on. We have a motion and a second right now to pull this and bring it back at a. Um, future meetings soon, so we don't delay if we do go there. So I'll call for um, a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And hearing none opposed, motion passes 403 to pull this item from the agenda. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you. We look forward to hearing from you again soon. Jeff. I'm concerned about time. Mm -hmm. um, so I make a motion to extend to 1130. Okay. Well, we have one action item. And the consent agenda, and then read out. I know, just but that case. just hurts. Just in Eleven. case, I'll just second case. that. Thank you, oh, Maria. geez. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor to extend the meeting to 11:30 if needed. Uh. Aye. <laughs> and those, that motion uh, passes 4:03. Okay. Item 9.13. This is approval of a resolution, 18:19.02, adopting school facility. Needs analysis and update of level two developer development mitigation fees. So similar to the previous item for level one, this is for level two developer fees and um, similar um, process and analysis was completed throughout the district um, and the various um, uh, enhancements there. And then within the resolution, you have um, the increase and then um, Ken is still here with us this evening. I've just had a, a few words to share on, on the level two. Again, it's a different set of regulations and allows a district to charge a larger fee than just a level one fee if you meet the criteria. And, and you do based on the fact that there's a significant number of portables in the district and you have a significant debt ratio comparing uh, your bond indebtedness to your bond capacity. So since you meet the criteria and our study justifies it, you can actually charge $5.47 per square foot. You're currently already collecting level two fees at a rate of $5.02. So this is a 45 cent increase. And again, allows you to collect revenues from new residential projects that are built. And again, it just helps supplement your bond program, um, along with the revenues that you can get from the state building program, those are the three main funding sources for your facility projects. For Kim, a 2,000 square foot house, that would be $940 in addition. Yeah. No, at 47 cents. A different additional, additional 40 cents. 45 cents, yes. For 45 cents. That increase. Fees. No, I know. I'm doing the difference. Anyway, go ahead. Do, you Do we? Okay, so I know we can charge this, but once we approve it, then it just isn't automatic, or how does it work? Because I do feel really badly that we're 
we're, we're charging these fees on the backs of working people that are trying to, you know, put a home together. Yeah, and, and, and it is challenging. Um, the reality, though, is, you know, this is about a 9% increase, um, but we're seeing that type of increase in actual bids when we're building school projects. Um, so it, it, it's just keeping up with inflation in construction costs. So it, it's, it's not a, a new fee, it's just an increase to keep up with your actual cost you're seeing when you, when you go out and approve these projects. Does it include remodeling or just a brand new, a brand new home? This is for the addition or new construction. So if you're remodeling your kitchen, no, it doesn't apply to that. It's just when there's an increase in square footage, more than 500 square foot to an existing home, or for the actual construction of new homes. I, I'm struggling with this too, because right now we're really faced with an affordability issue in this county, in the state, on the coast. And I understand it's just $900, but it, that's just an additional cost that we're, that we're putting on people. People, can't, people are struggling to afford homes now. To, to add more cost to that, I'm, I'm really struggling with this. And I've struggled with it in years past, but housing at the time wasn't, it was more reasonably priced. Prices have taken off. And so to put more cost on, on builders who are trying to provide housing or people who are trying to build a house for themselves, and I understand, I understand we need to improve our facilities, we need to grow, but, but people are getting priced out of the market. And the reason I know this is because I was sitting down with someone today. We were going over some notes, and I mean, they can't afford it. They're making one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. They can't afford a house locally, so we're just adding. We're just we're adding a burden to these people. Is how I see it. I think there's uh, two important points to talk about. One is again, this shows the maximum you're entitled to collect through the level two developer fee calculation. You do not have to charge the maximum fees. You can choose a lower rate. Well, the, but then, and but then, why are we going for the nine percent? It's a nine percent increase. Correct, and that that is the maximum you're entitled to charge. If if you don't want to charge that, you can stick at the level one rates. Um, if you want to charge less than the maximum you're entitled to, you can choose to do that. Um, it's it, it is a choice. If we're not collecting the fees through the developer fees that at the maximum rate, any shortfall, you know, can be compensated through your bond collection, uh, or you know, through passing local bonds. So this just helps reduce the impact to the community in, in the local bond property taxes. So it, again, there's multiple sources of funds, and it is a choice as to what you believe is the best resource. So are you saying if we, we pass this, uh, it gives us the flexibility to charge up to that amount? But we, don't have to. but we don't have to. So how do we manage that as a board? Well, our, okay, again, our recommendation is to charge that amount simply because <laughs> we, we hear that. Th th there are the impacts. And it, the dollars you receive in developer fees helps reduce the amount you have to go to the voters and for, ask with for the bond. property taxes. I, I think that's an important point because we're, we're already, how many lines are we on those property tax bills? I know between us and Cabrillo, there's a lot. And if that could offset, you know, our need to go out for a higher bond, um, you know, our costs are going up. Our construction costs are going up. Um. Yeah. And overall, it, it, it does shift the burden, uh, as I mentioned previously, multiple buckets of funding. So it, it establishes another source of funding. If that source of funding is reduced, then that burden is shifted to the other buckets. And whether that's our bond program or one-time money or general fund, um, but we do have um, throughout our district aging portables uh, that do need to be replaced and repaired. Um, and this is the one of the number one sources of funding 
to address that need uh, in regards to portables. But if we if we don't vote for this, we're not s saying don't charge a fee. We're just saying we're not going to we're not going to raise it nine percent. I mean, the money's already coming in. We're just not raising it. Correct. It'll so be it's, a reduced. It's not that it's not that th this the source is going away. It's that it's not growing. It's the it, it's not increasing as a percentage. Am I making sense? Yeah. Yes. Here. Y you're making sense, but technically, uh, this study needs to be approved because your ability to collect level two fees is an annual calculation. And so if you want to keep that at your current rate, you would still need to approve the study, but only justify the current rate you're collecting instead of an increase in the rate. So we're stuck? No. What he's saying is we need to pass this because it's a like an audit calculation that we do every year, but we can direct the business office to, right, am I correct? Not not increase it. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Correct. The, the old study expires, and so the new ah. study has to be approved. And, okay. and again, you, you can choose to collect whatever rate you want up to the maximum you're entitled to. I'm, I'm okay, okay with that. I'm okay with that, too. Are you okay with it, Jeffrey? I don't like having something brought to me that I have to approve. That's an issue for me. So do I, underst I understand. I understand. We're going to go through this as an audit issue, and I understand that. We, I don't want us to be out of compliance. But when I'm but when I'm being told I have to approve this, um, mm -hmm. that that's a concern for me, and I'm sure it's a concern for all of you too. I think this is something that we ha we approve every year because it has to be recalculated every year. So that's I think the approval we're approving the study that is the audit that calculates. So, um, so I'm still okay with that. So I just have one last comment, um, Joe. Then would at a future meeting would this be brought back to approve whether we want to increase the fee or keep it at where I it is right now? The uh, motion could be to approve the study, um, and then part of that motion could be a discussion or at a later point in time to confirm what the rate is or the increase is or no increase. Uh, that's to the board discretion. But the study has to be approved, um, and that's by code. That's not um, district administration or consultants saying that's, that's at code that we have to provide that. Um, and then within our annual audit, our fiscal audit, um, we just have to show that the study was completed, what is the rate that we're collecting, um, and then I'm going to have to explain is that in alignment with the study or not, and if it's not, which it will not be, if, um, I need to give an explanation why, but that could be an explanation in our audit report. Would that be considered a finding if we were not in alignment with the report, with the I would have to follow up with the district auditor on that, but it would be uh, an explanation. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if it would be a finding, but it would be an explanation of why we're not in alignment with the study um, okay. or a reduced rate. So I have a suggestion that um, we uh, vote on this and we ask for another agenda item to come forward okay. so we can talk about the, um, the rate, the developer, developer fee rate with the whole board here because I think if this is a discussion that is um, concerning to us there's three other board members that should probably be involved as well so that's my suggestion that's an excellent idea okay, I make a motion to approve the school facilities need needs analysis study level two for 2018 second okay all those in favor aye aye, aye. any opposed no opposed. Motion passes 403, and we're asking for a follow up agenda item. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to the consent agenda. Um, can we, we have a lot there, but um, is there um, a motion to approve? There's change orders. Mm -hmm. 
with the thank you that you gave us. Thank you. So either a motion or um, ask I to so pull. move. I so move to approve the consent orders. Is there a second? second? Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? President DeRose? Yes. Before we vote, I'd like to um, call out item um, 10.15, uh, approved with gratitude, $7,500 donation from the coming from the Community Foundation, I'm guessing on a donor-directed um, donation for Pajaro Valley High School for basketball team. So I'm not sure who the donor was behind that, but... Um, but I, I, on behalf of the district and Pajaro Valley, really uh, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful donation to the basketball team. Thank you for noting that. I did um, skip past that, and um, I think it, it is important that we um, make sure that we acknowledge those. So um, there's a motion and a second. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none opposed, that motion passes 403. No deferred consent items. Um, action on closed or reconvene closed, which we do not have to do. Um, action on and report on closed session. And this is Trustee Roscoe. Um, I move to approve the Pajaro Valley Unified School District certificated personnel as presented by the district administration with the addition of one administrative appointment. 39 new hires and two separations. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 403. Under item 2.2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration with the addition of two promotions, uh, three provisionary new hires, five leave of absences, and four separations. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> and hearing none opposed, motion passes 403. Do you want me to? Was that it? it? You have one more thing. Oh. It's a good thing we went to 1130 to sit back. No, I'm kidding. This, this is all good news. Go right ahead. Yeah, so under our classified. Um, Mike is Mike. off. Oh. Again? <laughs> They're turning okay. We're going to work on um, it. First, uh, classified the appointments that we just approved. Uh, we want to congratulate Sandra Sanchez, our new operations supervisor of food services. Uh, Mrs. Sanchez has been appointed um, as part of the food services department. She joins PBSD with experience serving as director of child nutrition services in Scotts Valley since 2013. Uh, prior to this, she managed the Boardwalk Bowl Cafe restaurant, served as a teacher assistant at Cabrillo College Children's Center. She has an associate's degree in liberal arts from Cabrillo College and is um, taking humanity and social services classes at San Jose State University. Ms. Sanchez helps work with over 60 families each month by overseeing participation in the Santa Cruz County Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, where she has volunteered for over four years. She also volunteers at the Guadalupe Pregnancy Outreach. Under certificated, we want to congratulate Veronica Aguilar, now our principal at Alianza. Um, and so this is a promotion. And Ver Veronica Aguilar has been part of the PBUSA family since 2005. She has served as a summer school coach, head summer school principal, migrant education supplemental teacher, teacher at Alianza Charter, where she's currently the assistant principal. Veronica has a master's degree in educational leadership from San Jose State, received her teaching credential for, from Bethany College, and earned a bachelor's degree in sociology from UC Santa Cruz. We also want to congratulate Charles Campbell, now our assistant principal at Watson Bowl High School. Um, he, um, sorry. He's currently at uh, a middle school assistant principal at Somerset Middle School in Monterey and served in a similar capacity at Rancho San Justo in Hollister. Charles taught elementary grades in Iowa, Alaska, and Peru. He taught AP Biology and Physical Science in Kansas. He has a master's degree in International School Administration and bachelor's in Biological Sciences. Charles has experience supporting a variety of district initiatives such as a Coach for Success 
He has volunteered to manage site facilities for Hollister Parks and Recreation. We also congratulate Susie Alarcon, now our team parenting coordinator. Um, Ms. Alarcon has a variety of teaching experiences and we are pleased to announce her appointment for this position. She has worked at San Benito High as a career technical education teacher in Hollister. She has served as a special ed preschool teacher, California student and family education coordinator, case manager, infant toddler center director, site supervisor and ROP vocational child development instructor, as well as a state preschool teacher, site supervisor for Gilroy Unified. She also owns a private consultant business in Gilroy focusing on human development, development, parenting, teen advocacy, and healthy relationships. She has an associate's degree in child development and fashion merchandising and attended Pacific Oaks College, Caliban Community, and the University of Laverne. Um, and then we also want to congratulate Sonia Heredia, now our coordinator, programs operation for child development. Since 1997, Sonia Heredia has served as an early childhood edu education master teacher at the Monterey County Office of Ed. Uh, migrant program, she has served as a site supervisor and early childhood education instruction leader. She has associate's degree in child development and a bachelor's in human development and master in leadership education, having attended Monterey Peninsula College at Harnell Col and Harnell College Salinas. She also volunteers as a professional growth advisor for California Department of Ed credentialing program and teachers catechism. So congratulations all. All right, and now under item uh, 2.3, uh, the board approved um, a separation settlement agreement for classify employee number 3224 um, with a 4-0-3 vote. And that's okay. all for closed session. Thank you. Um, okay, so item up uh, 14 is upcoming board meetings. Our next meeting will be a special board session on August 8th where we will be doing the annual um, superintendent's evaluation. That's a closed session um, meeting. We'll, we'll be open for public comment and then excuse the public and then we'll do our evaluation. And that's from 6 to 9 next Wednesday. And I'm sorry, two Wednesdays from now, and um, HR board room, H HR conference room. Okay, and then our next regular board meeting is August 22nd after school's back in. So um, looking forward to seeing you then. Thank you. <laughs>